All right, good morning, everyone. The court will call State of Wisconsin versus Darrell Brooks, case number 21, CF 1848. Uh, record should reflect that the state appears this morning uh, by District Attorney Sue Upper, Deputy District Attorney Leslie Basie, Assistant District Attorney Zach Wichow, uh, and the defendant Daryl Brooks appears in person in custody. I'd also like the record to reflect that he is appearing in jail attire today. He's also wearing a mask. I'm guilty, Your Honor. I did not identify by your name. What is your name? Brooks. I don't know. What's your name? Daryl. I would like the opportunity to state that I'm here concerning this matter as a third party intervener in this matter, appearing as authorized representative for my client. I accept for value and return for value all the charging instruments in this matter and make my exemption available for discharge of all obligations and charges connected with this case. I do not dispute any of the facts in the charging instruments and would like to now uh, reserve my rights if I may. Um, Mr. Brooks, you just interrupted me within a minute of us starting this case here today. Respectful. I'm asking you to respectfully not interrupt me. That's the second time. So I can go through the list of things that I need to get through this morning. I just wanted to state it for the record. Mr. Brooks, it the wasn't the proper time to do that. That's now the third interruption. So. With all due respect, Your Honor. Every Mr. time Brooks, we, every by time saying we, all due respect doesn't change the fact that you're interrupting me. Your objection is noted, all right? But you need to stop interrupting me um, so I can get through what needs to be done. But it is I have right a number to, of documents that I need right to discuss to, this morning. Right to, Mr. Brooks, you do not have a right to interrupt the court. No, um, was, I will remind you once again of the uh, Supreme Court rule. It's on a yellow laminated, uh, double-sided, uh, piece of paper that is before you. Um, I, I checked, I verified, that, uh, it is. I accept it in return. Mr. Brooks, value, that's right? yet another interruption. Let me get through this, please. I just want for the You record, will have an opportunity when I'll, I give you an I'll opportunity. No one stated, else is speaking at the moment but me. You need to stop interrupting. I don't identify by that name. What is your name? Brooks. I don't know. Mr. Brooks, I am going to keep going. You are warned. You need to follow the standards of courtesy and decorum for the courts of Wisconsin. I Chapter 62, to, that's to, another Honor, interruption. I intend to follow decorum. This court comes with a history of Mr. Brooks interrupting now. This is day four, and every day Mr. Brooks has interrupted. It has resulted in Mr. Brooks being uh, placed in a uh, neighboring courtroom so that this court can efficiently, effectively, and with dignity uh, preside over this case here today. I, I am object, well aware I that's another Your interruption. Honor. I'm I, well I aware. Stop talking. Which I have the right to do. I'm well and aware, Mr. Brooks, that you object to the name to that any, uh, has identified on the information and all documents in this case. Your objection is noted. It does not need name. to be repeated. I will make a record right now. Uh, the court yeah, notes the a, con a continuing right objection time. by Mr. Brooks of uh, his name. What is your name? Brooks. Uh, and uh, that he objects to being here. Uh, I know he's filed a number of documents previously related to, to that. Here, Those I documents respect. are I of record. There's that another that document that's right. filed at least two more interruptions just now. I believe I'm up to eight. Mr. Brooks, you're advised that continued interruptions will result in you forfeiting your right to be present in this courtroom where you'll be taken to the courtroom next door to appear by video and audio means to participate. To from the courtroom. In, right that's now. another interruption. And you haven't shown me any lawful uh, case law that I can be removed from the court Mr. Brooks. proceedings in a trial and forced under coercion and, dis and, and duress to appear in the trial that I am needed, that I've tried to express that I have the right Mr. To Brooks, there's a proper manner in which you raise objections. You have not followed that proper procedure. You are unable or unwilling to abide by simple rules of civility. You, you interrupt, you don't wait for anyone to finish, um, and it will result with you being removed from the courtroom. 
Um, so you are once time. again uh, reminded of that. I'm going to give a little slack at the moment only because we are not in the presence of the jury. I'd like to uh, go through a couple of things, the first of which is the jail attire. Mr. Brooks, we, meaning myself and the jail, have made arrangements by allowing folks to bring in uh, street clothing for you. You've appeared previously um, in a suit and tie, uh, very appropriate for a trial. If you no longer have those clothes available, the jail has a supply of clothes that they can also lend to an inmate. The reason we um, make those arrangements during trial, sir, is because this court has taken a number of steps to shield from this jury that you are in custody. Your hands are not shackled, okay? There are skirts around each shackled. one of the tables. I'm aware of the feet shackles. That's yet another interruption. I'm aware of the shackles on your uh, feet, and that's why the skirts are on your table and frankly, all of the tables, right? So that it appears to be the same for anyone coming in and viewing. Um, again, their arrangements have been made for you to appear in street clothes or civilian clothes. Um, I would like you to appear in street clothes. And the reason why, sir, is to reduce or even eliminate even the appearance that you are in custody. And it is your choice though. Are you willing to go back to your cell and put on your suit? Um, it is my right to do so or to not do so. And at this point, Your Honor, who doesn't know that I'm in custody? Mr. Who Brooks, know that? I've had many trials with individuals who were in custody. And when I've talked to the jurors after the conclusion of the case, they had no idea. The whole point of allowing for street clothing is not only to shield jurors from the fact that you are in custody, but also uh, you being in a suit and a tie or other street clothing, I think also lends to the dignity of the proceedings. This is a trial. Um, again, it is your choice. Are you willing to go back to your cell and be dressed in the street clothes that you previously appeared in? With all due respect, I do not agree with that assessment whatsoever. There's no possible way that anybody will not know that I am in custody. I think that's a well-known fact because it's reported on every day in the media. It's shown every day on the news where I am, what jail I'm housed in, and that I'm in custody. It's virtually impossible for anybody to not know that I'm in custody. Mr. Brooks, did you hear the question that I asked you? And I respectfully keep the position that I just put on the record. Mr. Brooks, I will ask you again. Are you willing to go back to your cell or into the jail and put on street clothes? I do not consent or agree to anything that you just stated, Your Honor. All right. He did not provide an answer to a very direct question. Uh, let the record be very clear that Mr. Brooks was given multiple opportunities to answer that question. Um, and I and go back, you. Mr. Brooks, that's yet another interruption. Um, I will advise you, sir, that at any point in time, if you wish to put street clothes on, um, I would give you that opportunity to do so. You've already heard it is my preference. Um, you've already heard me advise you regarding uh, the steps that have been taken to shield the fact that you are in custody from the jurors. Um, you refuse to answer my question about I whether refuse. you would uh, you go back to like the jail. To That's another interruption. Um, so based on his refusal and his I choice to refuse. come in, that's I another interruption. To say, to say based upon his uh, failure to answer my question directly, I will I take that as refuse. a non-response, but he came to court that here today. That's another interruption. Um, I will take that uh, because he's come to court here today in his jail attire, that that is a, a choice that he has made freely. Uh, voluntarily and intelligently. No one has forced him to come I to jail to in those clothes. This court is encouraging him not to. He's appeared previously in his 
uh, street clothes in what I would describe as a very nice suit and tie, um, but it is his choice to not do that and we will proceed accordingly. So while we're on the record, may I challenge the subject matter jurisdiction? No, you may not, sir. You need to file a motion in order to do that. Um, um, so Mr. Brooks, I filed haven't even been uh, responded to. I gave uh, Mr. Brooks, you're interrupting me no, yet you, again. You just weren't speaking, All right, so I, I Mr. Interrupt. Brooks, you are now going to be removed to the I other courtroom. To that. I have I'm had a duress. dozen or I more interruptions. Shot. I will be off the record while we do that. Thank you, I don't agree to a stop. Well, I move for a motion to dismiss for being under duress and being coerced into a contract that I, that I did not consent or agree to. Are you you're able to see the screen? Is that right? Okay. Yes. I'll publish that as well. All right, we are back on the record. Appearances are as they were before. I need to make a record that at 8.42 a.m. this court ordered Mr. Brooks be removed from the courtroom due to repeated uh, interruptions and disruption uh, with the court. Uh, this, of course, comes on the recent history with Mr. Brooks. At the moment, he is muted regarding Mr. Brooks's conduct. I'm told that um, he would not sit down while in this courtroom in order to have the shackles removed so that he could be taken to the other courtroom that he was resisting, um, that at one point he took off a shoe and it appeared uh, to the deputies that he was going to throw the shoe. Um, you can see that he is seated with his back uh, to the court or to the camera. He took his shirt off as well. I'm also told that he is threatening to throw and break items. Um, all right, then with that, um, I am going to uh, just take a short recess just to have the jurors brought in. I think Mr. Brooks needs his objection signed. We'll make sure he has it. Thank you. And gentlemen of the jury and everyone may be seated. I appreciate your patience as the court addressed some important legal matters with the parties this morning. I'm going to uh, read through the preliminary instructions at this time. Please pay careful attention just as a reminder. They're not something you need to memorize. Ultimately, at the close of the case, a very similar set of instructions are provided to the jurors to take back to the jury room. Before this trial begins, there are certain instructions you should have to better understand your functions as a juror and, and how you should conduct yourself while using trial. a dangerous weapon. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I still have uh, many pages of my jury instructions yet to read to you. However, it's 1154 and I would like to break, at least for the jurors, to have lunch. I have some uh, legal issues I do need to take up with the parties, um, but when you come back, the court will continue where we left off with the jury instructions. The jur jurors are excused for lunch. All right, thank you. Be seated. All right, Mr. Brooks, um, I am offering you an opportunity to come back to the main courtroom. Would you like to do that? I'm not sure why we're not hearing him very loud at the moment, but can you repeat that again? I see, yes. You'd like to come back? All right, we'll have you brought back then. Thank you. We'll be in recess until that is accomplished. It's 1.22, the record to reflect that Mr. Brooks is back in the courtroom. Um, I do wanna make a further record that he still remains in his jail attire. Uh, prior to the break, I did advise uh, the captain and to let Mr. Brooks know that he certainly could take the opportunity during the lunch hour to put on street clothes. Um, so it's his choice. Um, he is here in the jail attire. Um, he's at the table, uh, continues to be masked. 
Um, welcome back, Mr. Brooks. They never asked me during the break because I had so much other stuff going on. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not saying it was intentional on their part, but I was never asked. I just want to make that clear for the record. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Um, nonetheless, I provided you with that opportunity, and here you are. Um, please be mindful, sir, uh, that the right to be here can, of course, be lost if you engage in disruptful discourteous um, behavior if you uh, interrupt the decorum and do not show respect for the uh, judicial proceedings you would of course be subject to uh, removal and forfeiting your right to be present in this courtroom all right is there i'd like to bring uh, the jury out mr brooks uh, we are, or I am still going through the preliminary jury instructions. Um, I know you filed some objections. Those have been noted for the record as I advised uh, earlier this morning because I've approved of them. Um, there should be no objections. You had ample opportunity to do that. So um, I'm instructing you at this point not to object because um, I will consider whether that's being done for disruption. Um, if you have an objection, write it down on a piece of paper, pass it to the bailiff, and I'll take it up outside the presence of the jury. Just on so clear, I was talking about uh, objections to strictly jury, uh, jury instructions or the, the filings that I filed on the third. I'm not addressing those at this point, sir. I was just asking for clarification. I didn't know which one you, you were speaking on as far as the objections. I'm talking about objections during this court hearing to the court going through the preliminary jury instructions. Okay, I just need, I was just asking for clarification. Right. I'm not addressing any of those filings. I previously addressed those. It may not be to your satisfaction, but. Which you said to be honest about that. And I'm not going to repeat myself. So the record speaks for itself. Your objections in those filings to the extent, you know, whatever they are, are noted. They're part of the record. Um, and they will be available for you at a later point in time should you be convicted and uh, on appeal to make whatever arguments that you uh, need to or want to regarding those. But from my perspective, that is something I'm not going to take up any further. And any attempt by you to do that, I will have to consider whether that's being done to disrupt the proceedings and not for legitimate reasons reason for bringing it up was to make sure that they are offered into evidence. Sir, there's, we're not at the evidentiary phase. They're part of the record. They've been received. So there's, at this point, there's no evidence to be taken. We're not at that stage of the proceedings. So you will have an opportunity after the state presents their case in chief uh, and they rest to then present your case and to present evidence that's relevant to the issues before the court and the jury. So I'm not going to go through any further on what that means. That would be for me to provide you with an explanation of the law or procedure, but I expect you to not bring that up at this point in time or going forward. I don't understand, though, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Brooks, I've already addressed them. I'm going to bring the jury out. Please do not disrupt as the jury comes in and as I complete reading the preliminary instructions. Um, I am, uh, just for reference for everyone, I've read through 44 pages of 69 um, and so I still have a ways to go. Um, my intention would be to finish with the preliminary jury instructions, take a short break for all, including the jurors, and then come back uh, with opening statements. Um, and that's, you have a choice, sir, at that point, whether you want to give one, but the state goes first because they obviously have the burden of proof. And then you would have an opportunity to give an opening statement as well. But that's my plan, at least for the afternoon. I would like to go back over here, Your Honor. 
you would like to, uh, you're, vo you're asking that to voluntarily be taken to that courtroom. Well, I'm trying to seek to understand how uh, the testimony evidence that was given could be Mr. considered. Mr. Brooks, I already dealt with that. I'm not going to deal with it. If you want to go to that courtroom, are you waiving your right to be present right now? Can I at least raise the issue of subject matter jurisdiction? That's no, the there's no lawful motion before the court. You may not. Are you making a judicial determination that I cannot? Mr. Brooks, that? I'm going to bring the jury out. I'd like you to stay. That's my preference that you stay. You've certainly demonstrated throughout these proceedings that you have the um, capacity to follow the rules, that you have the intellect to make cogent, coherent, articulate, responsive arguments when you so choose. But when you start doing what you're starting to do right now, going back to filings I've already addressed and start talking about subject matter jurisdiction, that is a tactic by you that I believe is to disrupt and to delay the proceedings. That is not accurate, Your Honor. I respect your objection to my characterization of that is noted to make a motion for uh, finding a fact then. Your request is denied. On what basis? Uh, your request is denied, sir. Your Honor, I'm merely seeking to understand. On Mr. What Brooks, I refer you once again to document 244 uh, that you signed, that you acknowledged, uh, dealing with the right to um, of waiver Sorry, waiver of right to attorney. We went through all of the advantages, the disadvantages. You were advised of things, including uh, the charges that you face, the penalties that go along with them. We discussed the difficulty of representing yourself. Uh, you made a deliberate choice to waive your right to an attorney, which this court honored and granted. And you... I'm Mr. Brooks, don't time. interrupt me. Okay, now we're, we're, that's at least the second time. So don't interrupt me. I'm going to continue with these proceedings. Even though you're mild mannered, even though you're speaking in a soft tone of voice, the conduct still has the same effect. And that's to disrupt, to delay, and to show disrespect for the court proceedings. It is not. It is not my Mr. Intent. Brooks, it is not please. My I'm, I'm not going to force you to sit down. I'm You're welcome to sit down, but I am instructing the jury to come out. You, at your peril, run the risk of me admonishing you at in front of them at this point. I don't want to do that, sir. I'm seeking to merely understand. Sir, that. I cannot give you legal advice. Not, I cannot give I'm you the understanding that you advice. want. I'm not All right. asking for legal advice. I'm, I'm I cannot explain court procedures I'm or the law to you. I'm so with you. that, Mr. Brooks, that's another interruption. You keep going. Stop. I'm seeking merely to understand, Your Honor. I don't understand the nature and cause of the charges. Mr. Brooks, I've already dealt with these. I'm your your to bring up the, uh, subject matter. Mr. Jurisdiction. Brooks, if you keep interrupting me, then you will forfeit your right to be present because you're showing through your conduct that you will not follow the most simplest rule of civility in a courtroom, and that's by not interrupting. You continue to interrupt. It's been a couple of minutes since we've been on the record, and there's been uh, a number of times you've already interrupted me. You claiming to not understand, and you wanting to discuss subject matter jurisdiction, do not... Um, it's just, a, it's just a tactic by you. It, the fact that you are... Uh, doing that demonstrates to me that you came back over here, right, with absolutely no intention of following the rules. If that's what you want to say, that's, that's your but, assessment. It's not accurate. Well, my assessment will stand on the record, sir. It's, it's based so, on my observations. So respect, at this point, Mr. I Brooks, respectfully, I respectfully stop to interrupting that. me, please. I merely stop just interrupting me, sir. I'm not, you're, if you have an objection, sentence. write it down. I thought that applied to me being... It's from, applying from right now since you, you keep interrupting I, me while so I'm talking. What, so what is the purpose of me being present if I'm not able to ask simple questions that I do not understand? Mr. I'm just Brooks, seeking, I've been I'm more not asking for than legal patient advice. with you. And the issues that you 
keep trying to raise every time we're in here are not issues I'm going to raise at this juncture or address at this juncture in the proceedings. Is there right? a I've why? already, I'm not giving you advice. I'm not explaining the law. I don't need to do any of that, sir. All right. You filed what you needed to file. I've addressed every single filing on the record. It may not be to your satisfaction, but I have addressed them. That's inaccurate, All right. Yeah. Some of your with filings, sir, you're interrupting me yet again because you're not letting me finish with my explanation. Some of your filings do not require a specific line by line response by the court. I've addressed them in the way that I believe the law requires me to do. Again, that may not be to your satisfaction, and that is simply the way that it's going to be. But we are continuing on with the reading of jury instructions. It's important. They're going to come in, and it will be up to you whether you can demonstrate respect and courtesy, not only for these proceedings, but for the jurors that have been selected to hear this case. Your Madam Honor, Clerk, have the uh, jurors brought Your in, Honor, please. You're doing this with uh, judicial misconduct. You're making the judicial determination that I'm not allowed to ask questions, that I'm not allowed to question Your Honor, which is my right. I've merely brought up subject matter jurisdiction because it has merit. I've merely try to seek to understand the proceedings that I do not understand. You're rushing me to judgment by constantly removing me from the court when I should be present for all proceedings and I should be able to understand, which I do not. Once again, I do not understand the charges, the nature of the charges against me. I do not understand why your honor will not answer mere questions that would give me clarification on understanding. I'm not attempting purposely to be disruptive, disrespectful in any manner. But if I don't understand something, it benefits me to ask so that I can have clarity. The waiver that you speak of with the uh, attorney, I gave the right of uh, the, the waiver back in the way that I felt that it should be altered. And you said so yourself on the record that the word understanding was taken off of that paperwork that I sent back to you. That should have let you know right there further that I did not understand the proceedings and that was some of the issues that I'm bringing up now. It's, it's merely just clarification, Your Honor. I don't understand what is going on. It's not to be disrespectful. It is not Mr. to Brooks, prolong the proceedings. Do you it is understand not to, when I tell you not to interrupt me? No, Do you no, understand I do not. when I tell you you need to follow the rules of decorum? I believe you do. Please sit down. The jury's coming in. I'm, I still would like to Mr. ask Brooks, questions, Your Honor. Stop talking. We are proceeding with the continued advisement to the jury of these preliminary jury instructions, do not interrupt me. The record should reflect that the jurors are entering the courtroom. Your Honor, with all due respect. Mr. I Brooks, still... stop talking. It's not appropriate at this point in time. You'll have opportunity I I later to raise other issues, but the issues that you seek to engage with this court are issues I've already addressed. You have not. You have not shown uh, proof. Mr. That Brooks, you have the not jury shown. is in the courtroom. I understand that. You John. continue to talk despite being told to sit down and to pay respect to this court, to these jurors, to the process. It is my right to stand or to sit, Your Honor. It's my right. Mr. Brooks, you can stand. Life. You need to be quiet. Thank Your you. Honor, Mr. Honor. Brooks, please stop. I'm going to continue with the instructions. If you interrupt me, you will run the risk of being taken to the courtroom next door. I'm seeking to understand. Your Honor. Mr. Brooks, final warning. I'm seeking to understand. Your Honor. It, must, it must be some clarification. Mr. Brooks. I want you here. I want to Stop be here. Stop 
interrupting me. You were quiet. I didn't. Mr. Brooks, stop talking so I can read through the instructions. Your Honor, I cannot. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm going to continue with the jury instructions. I'm on count 38. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 38, you should find you the defendant satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of battery have been proved as to count 76, you should find the defendant guilty of battery as charged in count 76. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. Before we have the parties, uh, or before I give them the opportunity to make opening statements, I am going to excuse the jurors to address a few legal matters, give you an opportunity as well for a short comfort break. Um, we'll let you know when we bring you back in. Go ahead, sir. Um, I noticed that uh, one of the jurors, the lady in the black that's closest to the screen in that corner chair over there, I recognize her from um, my initial appearance. Um, she flipped me off coming in to my initial appearance and coming out. I know it's her for a fact. I've seen her about like how I'm looking at you right now. So I know for a fact that's her. I don't want that to end up being an issue. Is this some type of way that could be addressed by your honor? Um, Mr. Brooks, you had an opportunity to exercise preemptory strikes and even to question uh, jurors about that. You chose not to. So at this point, any issue you have with that juror is waived. Okay, uh, you do remember that I was not present in the courtroom. I couldn't, I couldn't see, all I can see from that courtroom in there is just you, your honor, and the prosecution's table. I can't even see the bailiffs. So it was no way for me to even see who the jury was. Obviously, I wouldn't know them by name. If I would have been able to see the jurors, I would have immediately addressed that. Um, I will make this one indulgence. Um, I'll have the civilian bailiff ask that juror if she was in attendance at your initial appearance out of an abundance of caution. Um, these are jurors though who with the jury questionnaires were also asked what knowledge they had about proceedings they watched or even attended um, and no one to my knowledge has disclosed anything like that but out of an abundance of caution we will ask that juror uh, if she was in attendance at your initial appearance. So for now, that's how I'll address it. I'll advise you of what her answer is later. Do we know the number? Um, do you know the number of the juror, sir? They have a number. Uh, I just know that I couldn't see that. I can't see the number from here. I just know the chair she was sitting in. Which chair, sir? Top row or the bottom top row. or the bottom row? The bottom row, the, the last black chair. Black so, shirt, she had the black they're shirt. all black chairs, sir. So the, the last chair black closer. chair closest to the television thank you sir because there are two sides right so there's the last chair on both sides so i wanted to make clear you're saying the chair closest to the television thank you i said that at the beginning your honor front row all right uh state have copies of the <clears throat> filings yes Uh, I will take these in order. Uh, the first uh, is a note from Mr. Brooks that was handed to Deputy Wittig at about 12.05. It says, I would like my filings addressed, parenthesis, notice of special appearance, statement of particulars. Both are, both are by affidavit, filed 10-322, which today is deadline to respond. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brooks. I'm respectfully declining to respond to those filings. That's my decision, sir. 
Are you making a judicial determination that those have no merit? Mr. Brooks, I have indicated to you on the record what I will or will not do. I would like to motion for a f finding a fact. Your request is denied. The next. May your honor explain why. Mr. Brooks, I'm going to go through these one by one. If I feel the need to make more of a record, I will do so. The record will be available later on. If you think I've made an error, you can then raise that on appeal. I know you're making an error, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to have a debate with you right now. I'm we are not. continuing on. I'm giving you the courtesy to respond to each one of these things. That's how I've responded. I expect that you will, even if you disagree with my decision, sir, that you will respect it and we'll move forward. The next piece of paper filed at 1.52 p.m. Are you making says, are you making a judicial determination? I'm not allow my right under the First Amendment to freedom of speech in this courtroom. Um, Mr. Brooks, um, we have rules of decorum and courtesy. They have been provided to you multiple times. They are part of the materials that you have before you. Do they fall under the First Amendment? SCR Chapter 62 discusses just the standards of courtesy and decorum for the courts of Wisconsin. In addition, sir, parties are able to file requests with the court. It's called a motion. A motion, however, is based in law there is a citation to not only that law, but relevant facts, and there's a request for relief. While you have the right to present a defense, you do not have a right to disrupt the proceedings. That was not direct, uh, uh, and disruption. Mr. I was, Brooks. I was asking, will my First Amendment right, which is freedom to freedom of speech, and a right to be heard in court, will that be honored by your honor? That's a valid question. Mr. Brooks, that's a constitutional I have right. given you ample opportunity to present information, evidence to question when we've had witnesses on the stand, but I expect you to follow the rules of procedure, the rules of evidence when presenting your requests. I can't even so, get these admitted into evidence. That's Mr. Brooks, I cannot explain to you if you don't understand the basis in law for the denial. You're right. I don't understand. But, so, I, I was but that doesn't mean we're going to have a discussion following, or a no, debate about debate you, what it means because we're not going to do that. The rules that you said so the bottom line is I don't feel, Mr. Brooks, stop talking. I do no, not I was feel. Right, I was following the rules when you said that I had to make all and objections And you did, and I'm going through them, writing. so let me. Give me the courtesy of replying or responding to these. And please give me the courtesy that even when you disagree with how I answer them, that you will not interrupt me. It's not about me trying to interrupt you, Your Honor. Mr. All Brooks, I'm, let, is, I'm going to address the next one. So you, please pay attention. What you were saying about decorum, I was asking, does that fall under the First Amendment? Because the First Amendment, which is my constitutional right, says that I have the right to freedom of speech and to be heard in this court. Mr. That's Brooks, all I'm again, you have the right to present a defense, and but that right is not unfettered. But that's that right, amendment. Mr. Brooks, you are interrupting me. Stop. Because you're talking about No, a, because you're, you're purposely doing this, but, so I can't get my reasoning out. You make it incredibly difficult. Amendment. I'm not refer referring to the Sixth Amendment. Mr. I'm referring Brooks. referring to the First Amendment. Which clearly says that I have the right to freedom of speech and to be heard in the courtroom. Are, are you not going to honor my constitutional right, Your Honor? If not, that is judicial misconduct, and you're making a judicial determination to not honor my constitutional right. I just want to be treated fairly, like anyone else, which you said on the record that you will be fair and impartial. Mr. Brooks, you also have an obligation to treat this court fairly, and you have an obligation to follow the rules of courtesy and decorum, the rules of procedure, the rules of evidence. Your Honor, that, that's not, the playing field that you willingly entered into and made a deliberate decision not. to waive your right to an attorney I and can, to appear in this here. case 
as your own attorney. I can sit and represent myself pro per. The same, the same paperwork that you gave me, you have, and I also have a copy of the same one where I scratched out what I did not agree or consent to. We both know that, Your Honor. All Mr. Brooks, simply, I made findings my... regarding that, and those findings stand that despite you scratching out uh, some of those words on but, there, I made you... very specific findings about uh, your waiver of right to an attorney. So we're not going to relitigate you that also, here right now. You also now. accepted the, the, the terms of the paperwork that I Mr. filed Mr. Brooks, out. I'm not going to engage with you about whether you and I have entered into some type of a contract. We, we did not. Or engage we in any type in, of, of that kind of dialogue. Because that's what you're claiming through some no, of these not, filings, and you've said that previously. I am not claiming that, Your Honor. So, in any way, Mr. Brooks, shape, or form, I do, I'm do giving you some leeway. Contract. You continue to talk over me. It's, uh, you please, I'm asking you to follow the rules of civility. Simple rule, sir. Don't interrupt me. Did I did I not just let you read the whole jury instructions and follow the rules that you said I have to write down? You did. Anything that I object to and then hand it in. Except now I'm, that we're discussing them, it seems to me that the rules don't quite matter to you, sir. No, that, that is not what, what's so being asserted here's on Here's what's happening, end. sir. I'm, all I'm telling you, all I'm, I'm advising for, you to respect the rules. I'm advising you that if you continue to interrupt, you risk forfeiting your right to be present in this courtroom. Are you? Because I still need to continue with these proceedings, sir. I need to go through all of the documents that you filed, and you're not letting me do that. Because we didn't so get I'm gonna. If I need to, it's, I'll remove you to the other courtroom so that I can do this, this is, and yes, exercise the mute button, sir. This, this but, is, and this then is I'll bring you back filed, when the though. jury's back. This was filed, though, Your Honor, and it's valid. He, Mr. Brooks is clearly not uh, following the simple rule of civility that I have established. That's he continues to Honor. interrupt. I'm, He's not uh, providing this court with ability Honor. to make rulings on the record without interruption. So this is your final warning, or you will be removed to the other courtroom. Will Your Honor honor my First Amendment right? I'm not answering that question, sir, because I've already addressed it. So you're making a judicial determination to deprive me of my constitutional right? I am not making any such determination, sir. So you just said you're not going to answer the question about my First Amendment right, which says Sir, I've already answered the question that you have a right to present a defense. That is the You have a right to be present. You're trying to twist up the amendments. You have a right to present your defense, but your rights are not unfettered. Yes, they your are, rights. Your Honor. You're citing the Sixth Amendment, which I am not Mr. Brooks, questioning. Your I'm, First Amendment, in some respects, is circumscribed by the rules of evidence and the rules of procedure. Does it say that I have So it doesn't mean speech? you get to say anything that you want in no, front I'm, of a jury. Your Honor, it doesn't mean you get to put forth any kind of evidence that you want your in front Honor, of a jury. I, I what being, it means, sir, is that you must am follow. You yes, you're your name, being disrespectful because you're I'm not, not doing anything of the sort. All right. I, he is continuously talking over me. So at this point, I'm going to find that he's forfeited his right to be present I as I go through right, his, I have not consented to any, I'm his paperwork. To he's to be removed to the other courtroom I'm until such time as he can pledge to follow the rules of the court and I'm civility. Not talking about the we'll be in recess me. until we have Your everything Honor, I did not agree to it. Uh, the record to reflect, I'm stepping off. The, the record... Uh, the record should reflect that Mr. Brooks is now appearing from the other courtroom. Would you like to come back to this courtroom for opening statements? So I'm on the record. You are. If you would please address my question. So you want me to come back over there just to get brought back over here? That's not what I asked you, sir. I, I told you, I advised you, I would like you back here. It's always my preference that you're here. You sh demonstrated previously that you can follow mm -hmm. some rules when the jury is present. The jury is going to be brought back in shortly for opening statements. The state will go first as they bear the burden of proof. And then you will be given an opportunity to also uh, present an opening statement. So my um, question to you, 
is, do you want to come back to this courtroom, sir? So I can get sent back over here, because as soon as I say something, I'm going to get sent, sent out. Mr. Brooks, it's your conduct in this courtroom it is what dictates the court's response. If you follow the rules of decorum um, and courtesy and civility, you will remain. But if you choose to you're, you're not do that, that, then you run the risk of once again forfeiting your right to be present. You say that even though I never consented to being taken out. You say you say that everything is about the decorum and all this. That's what you say. But when I'm raising issues of understanding, which I keep telling you I don't understand, then it's looked at as being disruptive. It's looked at as intentionally trying to be disruptive. And I, I don't understand why everything I say has to have some type of disruption title to it. It's even been put on record numerous times with inaccuracy, even what happened today. Nobody reported on record about me being bruised up and having to get bandaged up and, and, and all these things, but it was put on me, laid at my feet as if me quote unquote being disruptive was deserving of what happened to me. I'm simply trying to have a fair trial. And if I don't, I, Forgive me for being this way, Your Honor, but if I don't understand, I'm going to ask questions. That's the only way I can have clarity is by asking questions. And you have refused to answer anything, but I have to answer everything you ask me. Where's the give and take? It should be it should be fair. I'm not asking for legal advice. I'm not asking for nothing like that. I'm asking to simply have clarification so that so that I can understand. I cannot put on an adequate defense if I don't understand something. Do you see these boxes I got right here? Do you think I was able to go through everything in those Mr. boxes? Brooks, I'm not going to go through this with you again, where you attempt to put on the record all of these issues that you have when we're in the middle of a trial. All right. You willingly waived your right to an attorney. I made all of those findings, so we will go forward. You made those findings. I am not obligated to answer questions. You made when those you ask me questions. I'm going to mute him. Um, yeah. I am not obligated to answer questions that uh, explain procedure or the law. Um, I am obligated to address uh, motions to address that are based in law and fact. Um, I'm obligated to uh, to address objections, for example, whether it be to testimony or evidence or questions uh, posed to witnesses. Um, but I'm not obligated, sir, to provide you with an explanation of the law of the procedure. Um, and with that, since I gave him two opportunities uh, to answer a very direct question, and that was, do you want to come back to this courtroom? Um, and he chose not to answer it, but instead ask a question and then start making statements about his lack of understanding. I will find that his non-response, uh, that he has not answered directly, which to me says he's not willing to follow the rules of decorum and courtesy and civility and without such a pledge he will remain in that courtroom um, he's muted the record should reflect it appears he's talking um, as well he's making hand gestures his lips are moving behind the mask um, and i just wanted to make a record of that all right um, then we will have the jurors brought in and then the state can then proceed with its opening statement. All right, at this time, we will give the parties the opportunity to make opening statements. Does the state have an opening statement? Yes, thank you. And just for the record, um, Mr. Brooks is appearing from the other courtroom. Uh, that should not influence your verdict in any way, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Go ahead, Attorney Wichow. It was a cold, windy Sunday afternoon in November. Thousands of people were bundling up and going downtown to watch the annual Waukesha Christmas Parade. 
The event started off normal. There were dance teams, high school marching bands, local community groups, local businesses, all making their way down the parade route. The streets were lined with friends and family members and neighbors, people there to soak up the atmosphere. Kids ran into the street to grab candy from the people who were throwing it from the parades. It sounds corny, but I think you'll see from the videos, there was a true sense of joy in the air. Daryl Brooks killed that joy. He replaced it with terror, trauma, and death. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Brooks left behind a trail of carnage and chaos as he made his way down Main Street through the parade route. The evidence will show that he left that crime scene, created that crime scene, in fact, because he was fleeing from another one, one where he had laid his hands on a woman and where police involvement became inevitable. So as he careened down Main Street, swerving from curb to curb, hands glued to the steering wheel, eyes fixed on the road in front of him with a silent rage on his face, he hit the gas with his red Ford Escape and used it as a battering ram over and over again, striking men, women, and kids. In the end, Mr. Brooks killed six people. He injured dozens more and left a permanent scar on this community. We are going to present evidence to you over the next several days in chronological phases, in order of events, from start to end. I'm gonna take a few minutes, I'm gonna lay out for you the table of contents of this story. We're gonna set the scene with Sergeant Dave Warner from the city of Waukesha Police Department. Sergeant Warner was the highest ranking police official working at the parade that day. He was the incident commander for the Waukesha Christmas Parade and we are going to, with Sergeant Warner's help, take you through this, which is the first of three maps that we will refer to repeatedly throughout this trial. This map depicts the area that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of days, the parade route. Now for those of you not entirely familiar with downtown Waukesha, this is going to look like a bunch of gibberish, but once we get going and we repeatedly refer to these street names and the business names and the groups that were involved in this parade, I think it'll become like a second language to you. Sergeant Warner will describe for you how the, the parade route ran uh, from, if you look closely at the screens in front of you, the intersection of Main Street and White Rock Avenue. White Rock was a staging area for the parade groups and floats. And they made their way southeast on White Rock until they came to Main Street and then they would make a right turn and head southeast down Main Street through the parade route until the very end as it wraps around to the south and runs into Wisconsin Avenue. The parade route then would continue to the east, making a left-hand turn on Wisconsin, but nothing really happens on Wisconsin Avenue. You're not gonna hear any testimony about that. As you can see from this map, it depicts or represents uh, each intersection where a squad car or a police officer was stationed. They're denoted by the little badge shields uh, in the intersections. If you look closely, you can see little red lines, and Sergeant Warner will describe how those represent the barricades that were placed at each intersection for security and safety purposes. Once we've got that established, we're going to move into the first chapter of this story, and you're going to hear about the origin of Mr. Brooks's rage that day. A violent domestic argument with Erica Patterson his former girlfriend and the mother of his child. Erica Patterson is going to testify, either today or tomorrow, hopefully today. She's going to tell you that in November of 2021, she was staying at the Women's Center, which is a shelter here in Waukesha. And on the day in question, November 21st of 2021, the defendant showed up in Waukesha in his red Ford Escape that she knew he drove, and he argued with her. And he harassed her. And he punched her in the face. And the thing about a swollen eye is it's tough to fake. 
You're going to hear evidence about how after, uh, well, let me back up. You're going to hear evidence about how the defendant took Erica Patterson all over town that afternoon, from Frame Park, across the river, up Barstow Hill, back down to Frame Park. And at some point after she was struck, after she sustained that injury, Erica called her friends because she needed help. And she had no one else to call. One of those friends is Corey Runkle. You're going to hear from Corey on the witness stand in this trial. Corey's going to say that she was Erica's roommate at the Women's Center. She had known Erica for a few weeks and they had grown close. And when she got the call from Erica that Erica needed help, Corey immediately responded to help. And she ended up finding Erica and Daryl Brooks in front of the White Rock School. If we go back, the White Rock School is on White Rock Avenue. It's on near the top right portion of the map. It's just south of Frame Park. And Corey is going to talk about how she, she found Erica and the defendant at this, at this location, and she got into both a physical and a verbal altercation with Mr. Brooks. That altercation is captured on surveillance video, two surveillance videos actually. You're going to see both of them. You're going to see how the defendant was reacting that day. You're going to see what he looked like, what he was wearing, the red Ford Escape that he was driving. You're going to see how the defendant reacted once Erica's friends showed up and he lost his physical advantage over a woman. Erica and Corey will also testify that at some point during this scuffle, the police were called. And you're going to see a separate video, a squad video, from the responding officer that shows just down the block there was a marked squad car with its lights flashing, marking the entrance to the parade. Something that people in front of White Rock School would have seen. So the evidence is going to show that the defendant must have known once things got loud and once there was more than just him and Erica on scene, the police were going to show up. So he took the coward's way out. You're going to see him in the video get into the driver's seat of that red SUV. Corey and Erica will tell you that no one else was in the car. And you're going to see him pull off on White Rock towards Main Street. You're going to hear from law enforcement officers who were positioned along the parade route. The officers who made their initial contact with the defendant, the first ones who tried to stop him. And the first one is Detective Tom Casey, the lead detective in this case. He's sitting at the state's prosecution table right behind me. He's going to tell you that he was working that day as security for the parade. He was working at Maine and White Rock. He's the first law enforcement officer to come into contact with the defendant during this incident, face to face, or I would, I think, better describe it as face to windshield. He tried to stop the defendant, but there's only so much a man can do against an SUV. But he's going to tell you that he got so close, he got such a good look at Daryl Brooks's face that from that witness stand, he'll be able to say to you definitive, definitively, Daryl Brooks, the man in orange on the video screen, is the man who was driving the red SUV in this case. You're going to hear from a few more officers. Uh, Officer Bryce Butcher and Officer Sonia Schneider. They were positioned at the intersection of Main Street and East Avenue, just a little bit further southwest uh, in that map. You're going to hear them describe how they saw this red SUV approaching. They quickly realized it was not part of the parade. They quickly realized this was a problem. There are people, children, in the street, lining the street. And so they jumped into action. They tried to stop it. As the, barrel, as the SUV started barreling towards them, Officer Butrin again tried to get in the way. He put himself at risk trying to get in front of the vehicle. Couldn't stop it. Officer Schneider tried to redirect the vehicle up Buckley Street, making a right-hand turn. She'll tell you, and you'll see in the video, there was room. There was space. She couldn't do it. The defendant blew past her. And that's when the screams in the police radio start. You're going to hear from Jim Hawkinson, a battalion chief for the Waukesha Fire Department. He's going to tell you about the massive scope of the emergency response to this tragedy. 
He was in charge of the fire department that day. He's going to tell you about all of the units that had to respond to the scene. The massive amount of resources needed to triage and treat and transport all the victims. He's going to tell you about the response from other communities in southeast Wisconsin, the mutual aid call that went out, and all the other communities that came to help out. He's going to tell you about how Waukesha Memorial Hospital, just up the hill from the parade route, quickly reached capacity. And so everybody had to be diverted to other medical facilities. We'll transition then into the next chapter of this story, and you're going to hear from some of the people whose lives were forever changed by the defendant's terrible decisions that day. But I'll tell you right now, you're not going to hear from all of them. It wouldn't make sense, it's not necessary. We intend to present the evidence to you in an efficient and streamlined way. We will elicit testimony and introduce exhibits that cover every element of every single criminal charge in this case. But our goal is to avoid duplication of evidence and to avoid undue hardship on the victims and the witnesses who have already suffered so much. So the first witness in this part of the trial that you're going to hear from is Nicole White. She's the very first person, aside from Detective Casey, who was struck by the defendant on that day. She's going to tell you, as we look at this second of the three maps that we're going to repeatedly refer to, that she was marching with her co-workers and friends with uh, Remax. You'll recognize the float, I think, in the videos because just like the commercials for Remax, there's a giant hot air balloon that shoots fire out of the basket, which is pretty cool. And she's gonna tell you, she was watch, mar marching with her friends and her co-workers when, without any warning, she was hit from behind and knocked over. You're gonna see video of that. Nicole White has a, a special significance in this case because as the first person who was struck, she represents the point in time when Mr. Brooks was legally required to stop. You heard the judge read the, the hit and run jury instructions. And to summarize, in Wisconsin, anybody who's operating a motor vehicle who's involved in some kind of accident, they have a duty to stop, to investigate, to exchange information. Not only did Daryl Brooks not stop, the evidence will show that he sped up. The evidence will show that as his body count increased, so did his motive to get away. Nicole White, I think is a good point here uh, for me to explain to you or to summarize for you the charge of first degree recklessly endangering safety. Now again, the judge read the law to you all morning and a lot of the afternoon and she's gonna read it to you again at the end of the case and you're gonna have a binder with all these instructions written down for you so you do not need to memorize them, okay? But we're gonna talk about first degree recklessly endangering safety. It's a crime where it's committed by someone who recklessly endangers the safety of another human being under circumstances that show utter disregard for human life. Let's talk about what the state's not required to prove with recklessly endangering safety. Not required to prove injury. This was a conscious decision in our charging decision. We're not gonna get into medical records, we're not gonna talk about the details of witnesses' injuries because it's not relevant, except to the extent that it proves that they were uh, endangered and resulted in injury. But we don't need to get into who was hit or how hard or how long they've suffered. We just are going to prove to you that their safety was endangered. So, after Nicole White, we are going to talk, you're going to hear evidence about the first uh, of the larger groups that was affected by this incident, the Waukesha South High School Marching Band. Ten kids in that band got either hit or run over. Here's the first example of our efficient presentation of evidence. You're not going to hear from any one of them. High school aged kids, there's video showing each and every one of them getting run over. So instead, you're going to hear from their band director, Sarah Weimar Aparicio. She's going to come in and she's going to look at some still shots of the video. She's going to identify each of the 10 kids for you. You're then going to watch and listen to the video. And it'll be clear as day who's getting run over or hit. 
it'll be clear as day whose safety was endangered by Mr. Brooks that day. As we move further down the parade route, you'll hear evidence about the Burris Logistics Group. You'll hear uh, testimony from Kelly Grabo about how she was marching with that group along with her young daughter. You'll see video of them. They're dressed up uh, like the Who's from Whoville. You'll see them get hit. As we move further down the parade route, you'll hear testimony about the Green family. They're spectators along the parade route. Charles Green is going to come in and talk about how he was there with his family. He was sitting on the southeast corner of Maine and Gasper across the street from Martha Merrill's books. He'll talk about how his kids were seated on a, a portable bench, something that you bring to a parade to sit on, and how they got knocked off that bench when the defendant ran into them. The next point um, in the presentation of evidence will involve the Waukesha Blazers. I think it's important to point out you can't consider this evidence of each crime in a vacuum. You need to consider the entire incident. Because at this point, by the time we get to the Blazers, the defendant will have already hit or run over 15 people. You'll see in the video that at this point the defendant has actually increased his speed. And you'll hear from Detective Mike Carpenter with the Waukesha Police Department. He's going to come in and talk about speed analysis. He'll tell you that he's certified to use a software program that basically takes surveillance video, measures distance in that video, and calculates an average speed over that distance. And he'll tell you that in video obtained from Bosco Social Club, which is right in front of where the Blazers got hit, he'll tell you that that video in that area right before the Blazers got hit, the defendant was traveling in excess of 33 miles an hour. There were five victims in, in the Blazers. That includes Jackson Sparks, who was watching, walking with his big brother Tucker. Cut down in the road before he had a chance to put any miles on his soul. Jackson was eight. He died two days later in the hospital. I think this is a good point to talk about the law of first degree intentional homicide. Again, the judge provided the law to you. It'll be provided to you again at the conclusion of the trial. I want you to take a look at that second element. I don't know what the defense in this case is going to be. In fact, the defendant isn't required to put one on at all. He can sit there and not say a word throughout this trial, and that's perfectly within his right, and you can't hold that against him. And in fact, if, we, if he does that and we don't prove each and every one of these counts to you beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find him not guilty. That's the law. But if he does choose to present a defense, if he does raise any issues, I expect that he will likely claim that he didn't mean to kill these people. Take a look at that second bullet point. Keep that in mind as you're watching these videos, as you're learning about how this parade unfolded. Consider whether the defendant was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. We're going to move further down the parade route, and the next group after the Blazers is the Extreme Dance Group. There were girls of really all ages in this group, from toddlers being pulled in strollers up to high school age teenage dancers. Fifteen victims, fifteen people associated with this group either got hit or were very close to getting hit. That doesn't include two additional spectators who were watching the parade from the south side of Main Street near the Five Points intersection, right in front of the, of the extreme dance team as the defendant drove through. <coughs> Girls in this dance group suffered catastrophic injuries. The group of victims also includes parents, grandparents, siblings, people marching with the group, but not necessarily as dancers. 
You're not going to hear from everybody who got hit. You're going to hear from the two instructors, the two young ladies who were tasked with teaching these girls these routines and marching with them and encouraging them and comforting them after the fact. And they're going to, in the video, identify for you where all these girls are positioned, and it'll be very clear the path of travel of the vehicle as it goes through that group of young ladies who was hit and who was nearly hit. The next uh, group down the parade route is Citizens Bank. And here we reach the second count of intentional homicide. Jane Kulik was marching with Citizens Bank with her friends, with her co-workers. This is the only count of homicide for which there is no clear video depicting how she died. So instead of watching video, you're going to hear evidence from her co-worker and from the man who was driving the truck pulling this float. And they're really the ones who are in the best position to observe exactly what happened to Jane Kulik as the defendant plowed through that parade route. And they're going to describe for you how she was struck, how she was run over. The medical examiner will explain that Jane Kulik's cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. We'll move further down southwest along the parade route and we'll learn about a group that was standing in front of the steaming cup, spectators, again. Innocent people have nothing to do with anything. You're gonna hear about three kids who were standing al along with a bunch of others along the curb in front of steaming cup. And as the defendant swerved from the left side of the street as he hit Jane, back to the right side of the street as he was avoiding the vehicle that was ahead of him, clipped the curb, and hit these three kids. Then we're going to move in to the next group in the parade route, which is the Dancing Grannies. This is the deadliest point in the parade. Seven people in this group were struck. Four of them died. You're going to hear from witnesses, uh, members of the Dancing Grannies group, who will come in and they will describe being completely caught off guard. They will describe seeing pom-poms in the air. And the next thing they knew, there were bodies on the ground before the pom-poms hit the ground. You will learn about Bill Hospital, who was walk marching in a support capacity. He was there to support his wife Lola and their friends, the rest of the dancing grannies just walking along the parade route, trying to be helpful. And as the defendant swerved around the Dancing Granny's vehicle, which is a white SUV, you'll see it in the video, swerved around the right side, he hits Bill. And the medical examiner is going to tell you that Bill Hospital cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll learn about Tamara Durant marching with the grannies. This is her first parade. You'll see a diagram of where she was positioned. You'll see video of her getting struck. The medical examiner will tell you that Tamara Durand cause of death, multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll hear about Lee Owen, another dancing granny positioned right next to Lee, excuse me, right next to Tamara who had just begun one of her favorite routines, walking in a winter wonderland, when she got hit. You'll learn about Jenny Sorensen. You'll learn that Jenny was walking at the front of the group, carrying the banner. You'll learn that Jenny was normally a coach for the group. Normally she rode in the vehicle, in the back, so that she could provide feedback and critique to her dance mates. But she filled in at the last moment today and helped carry the banner. You'll see video of Jenny getting struck. Medical examiner will tell you that Jenny Sorensen's cause of death was multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. You'll hear 
more speed analysis, tes analysis testimony at this point. You're going to hear from Mike Smith with the Wisconsin State Patrol, who's going to testify very similarly to how Detective Carpenter is going to testify about speed analysis. Basically, he takes surveillance video, this time from Curry Insurance, which is on the south side of Main Street. It shows the grannies getting struck. They measure point to point, and <coughs> measure the time between those two points, and calculate an average speed over that distance, which is roughly from Clinton Street up until the camera cuts out. I'll tell you that at that point, where the defendant crashed through the Dancing Grannies group, he was traveling at approximately 32 miles an hour. The eighth and final group that was struck by the defendant in this case is the Catholic Communities of Waukesha. This is a faith-based organization. It consists of members of multiple local Catholic churches who got together that Sunday afternoon to spread a little Christmas cheer. There is not great video, and perhaps that's for the best, of this group getting struck. In total, there were 19 victims in this group. In what little you can see from the video, you can see the defendant's taillights swerving from the left side of the street to the right. You can see them bouncing up and down. There are no speed bumps in that section of the road. The next phase of the evidence will involve uh, the manhunt. How authorities found the defendant, took him into custody, and the statements he made after he was placed under arrest. You will hear from Officer Bryce Skolton, who was positioned, if you look at this third of the three maps I referenced, uh, on the very top of this map at the intersection of Main Street and Wisconsin. Officer Skolton was positioned at that point to direct the parade route to make a left-hand turn from Main Street onto Wisconsin, to stop any traffic coming from the other directions. He saw the defendant come around that corner. He saw the defendant drive right at him as he's standing in the middle of the road. And as the defendant went around him to the left and went south, Officer Skolton fired three rounds from his service weapon. All three rounds hit the car. None of them hit the defendant. You will hear from uh, another police officer who was not on duty that day. He just happens to be a police officer. His name is Officer Ralph Salyers. He's from the Wauwatosa Police Department. If you take a look at that map, he's going to describe to you being uh, on the sidewalk, leaving the parade. He was walking past Les Paul Middle School. He's going to describe hearing a loud commotion. He's going to describe <laughs> seeing a red SUV with just utterly total front end damage coming to rest uh, in a driveway at 338 Maple Avenue. You're going to see video of the defendant in the red SUV pulling into the alley behind 338 Maple and then a few moments later you'll see what appears to be the defendant coming back onto the screen and running away from the vehicle, apparently in a hurry, apparently aware that he had done something terribly wrong. You're going to hear from a series of witnesses between that point and the defendant's arrest where they will describe the defendant approaching them, contacting them, asking them to use their phone. Because he was in such a rush when he ditched his SUV, he left his phones behind. Then you're going to hear from Daniel Ryder, and I think the evidence will show Daniel Ryder really is a good embodiment of the spirit of Waukesha. Not knowing what Mr. Brooks had done, Daniel Ryder opened his home to the defendant. The defendant showed up at his front door without any shoes on, with a t-shirt, said he was cold, said he needed to use the phone. Daniel Ryder let him inside, gave him a sandwich, let him use the phone, and then gave him a coat. And a few minutes later, the police showed up. You're going to see body cam video of that arrest. You're going to hear from Officer Rebecca Carpenter that she responded to that area around where Daniel Ryder lives because of reports of a man knocking on doors. She takes him into custody. 
he identifies himself on the body cam video. They search him, and in his pocket they find a red, excuse me, a key to the red Ford Escape used in this attack. You're going to hear from a series of officers who retraced the defendant's steps that night, recovered surveillance video showing the path that he took, the path that's depicted here in the third map that I'm showing you. You're going to hear how they recovered his sandal, his sweatshirt along the, the escape route. You're going to hear from Detective Jay Carpenter with the City of Waukesha Police Department, and he's going to talk to you about the defendant's statements after he was taken into custody. I'm going to let that interview speak for itself other than pointing out for you that you will, I think, quickly learn a few main points about the defendant on the night that this happened. He was lucid. He was aware. He was intelligent. He was probing for information. And he was deceptive. We're going to then wrap up with testimony from people who plugged any of the remaining holes in the investigation. You'll hear from crime lab analysts, about DNA evidence, about finding the defendant's DNA on the steering wheel of the Red Ford Escape. You're going to hear from Wisconsin State Patrol Inspector Ryan Schultz. He's going to testify about the mechanical inspection that he did on this vehicle. In case you were wondering if there were any issues that would have prevented Mr. Brooks from stopping or from pulling over, he's going to quickly put those concerns to bed. He conducted that mechanical inspection. No problem with the brakes. The accelerator didn't stick. There were no mechanical problems that would have prevented Mr. Brooks from stopping. Finally, we're going to close our presentation of the evidence, not with a witness, but with an experience for you. You are going to go to a secure location, and you're going to have a chance to see the murder weapon with your own eyes. You'll be able to see that red Ford escape. I want to close now with a few points about how the evidence relates to the law in this case. There are, obviously, we've gone through the six counts of first-degree intentional homicide, but in addition to those homicide counts, there are six counts of hit-and-run involving death. Those are separate charges. The evidence will support convictions on all of them, all 12 counts of homicide, but they involve the same six victims. Another point I want to bring to your attention is that for each count of first-degree intentional homicide and each count of first-degree recklessly endangering safety, if you find the defendant guilty of any of those counts, you have to answer a second question. Did he commit that crime while using a dangerous weapon? And here the evidence will show that he didn't use a gun or a knife to commit these crimes. He used 3,500 pounds of steel, rubber, and glass. The defendant's also charged with two counts of felony bail jumping. You'll hear evidence uh, to support those charges, which includes the fact that the defendant was charged with a felony offense in a case in Milwaukee County and released from custody subject to conditions of bail. And then he was charged with another felony offense in a separate case in Milwaukee County and released from custody subject to conditions of bail. And those conditions of bail included requirements that he not commit any new crime. And those conditions of bail were in effect on November 21st of 2021. We have dozens of video clips to show you. You're going to have notebooks and writing utensils while we present this evidence to you. It's a lot to keep track of. And when you go back into the deliberation room, it might be difficult while you're deliberating to remember which video was about which victim, or which incident, or which group. And so my suggestion to you is that as we go through these videos, you're free to do whatever you want with your notes, but my suggestion would be as we go through these videos, they each will be labeled with an exhibit number, and so I recommend that you keep track of which exhibit number corresponds with which video. That way, while you're deliberating, if you want to see those videos again, you can ask for them by exhibit number. Can't guarantee that you'll be able to see any or all of them, but you can ask. I'm done now. I want to close on one final point, and that is, on behalf of the state of Wisconsin, I want to say thank you. We work 
you're serving in what is the greatest criminal justice system in the history of the world, and that's because of the 16 of you. It's because a group of citizens, randomly selected, come in and make the final, ultimate determination between guilty and not guilty. That's unique in this world. It's special. And so, we're going to go through this evidence. We're going to be mindful of your time. We know how valuable it is. We're going to be efficient, but we have a lot to get through. A lot. And at the conclusion of all that evidence, District Attorney Opper is going to stand up here and she's going to ask you to render verdicts consistent with the evidence, to find the defendant guilty of each and every count. Thank you. Mr. Brooks, my first question to you is, will you be making an opening statement at this point or deferring until your case, meaning the defense portion of the case? Uh, I will be deferring at this time, Your Honor. I need uh, a little more adequate time to make sure I go over the points that I need to make. All right, then the court will... Uh, Honor that request, advise the jury he's deferring his opening statement until a later point in the proceedings. Very well, then the state may call its first witness. Thank you, Judge. State call Sergeant Dave Warner. Uh, my name is Sergeant David, D-A-V-I-D, Warner, W-A-N-N-E-R. Thank you. Go ahead, Attorney Opper, your witness. Thank you. Uh, sir, how are you employed? I'm a patrol sergeant with the City of Waukesha Police Department. How long have you worked in law enforcement? 18 years. And uh, as patrol sergeant, what are your general duties and responsibilities? I oversee officers uh, across all shifts uh, that are assigned to the patrol division. I want to direct your attention to the date of November 21, 2021. Did you work that day? Yes. Were there any events occurring in the city of Waukesha that afternoon? The Waukesha Christmas Parade was that afternoon. Has the Christmas Parade uh, been held in years prior to, uh, excuse me, prior to 2021? Yes, every year that I've been employed at the police department, we've had a Christmas parade. And uh, is it typically that third week in November before Thanksgiving? Yes, every year that I can remember it has been. Okay. Is there any planning or preparation that goes into uh, holding a parade in Waukesha? Yes, there are meetings with the uh, um, group that's putting on the parade in advance. Um, there's also uh, a group of individuals that prior to the parade, usually the Friday before, will post no parking signs along the parade route. Uh, there's a, a group from our, um, our city garage or Department of Public Works that will put out barricades at the designated intersections. Uh, where we request them to put them out. And what about uh, manpower? What type of manpower would you devote to uh, an event like this, sir? Uh, it's rather significant uh, given the, um, the large area that a parade like this uh, encompasses, the estimated uh, amount of attendance at the parade uh, between detectives, police officers, supervisors, reserve officers, community service officers, uh, I would say we have an excess of, of 30 additional bodies uh, planned that day just to handle the parade itself. You mentioned um, the use of uh, individuals such as reserve officers and community service officers, I think you said. Is that correct? Yes. Are those sworn law enforcement officers? They are not sworn, no. What is their role or function? Uh, the reserve officer group is a, a group of people who volunteer their time to help with um, events like parades. Um, they're given training in directing traffic and closing streets down. Um, a community service officer is a, a paid position. They're part-time employees, um, usually younger um, individuals um, learning to, or looking to learn more about a career in law enforcement. And you said uh, also parking attendants would be assisting in this endeavor? Correct. We usually, we're, we're usually looking to get as many extra bodies as we can, and the, um, the assistance from our parking agents is usually required for this event as well. 
and this would be in addition to the sworn law enforcement officers that are assigned to work the parade. Correct. And obviously you still need other officers to patrol the city, correct? Yes. Where is the parade held? Uh, it's, uh, the, the parade takes up a large portion of our downtown area. Uh, there's a staging area that uh, the floats before the parade that they're all instructed to assemble in a particular area along White Rock Avenue uh, between Niagara Street and Main Street. And that's about a three hour process of getting all the parade, par parade participants into that area and, and lined up accordingly. Um, the parade itself uh, runs along Main Street um, from White Rock westbound uh, to the Veterans Park area um, where it makes a turn and then heads up Wisconsin Avenue and ends near the Waukesha Public Library. Sir, if I could ask you to stand up and refer to the uh, diagram behind you. This is a map that's been marked as State's Exhibit Number 1. Do you see that sticker in the bottom right-hand corner? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, it's a little tight up there. Sorry. But um, if you could start in the upper right-hand corner of the map, and uh, yes, what's up there, please? That is Frame Park. And uh, is there, what's at Frame Park? Uh, Frame Park has a lot of, uh, it's got a playground for children, there's a very large baseball diamond, um, different shelters, there's a formal garden, there's a boat launch. Um, it's a very large park in our, in our city that encompasses a lot of different activities. Is the boat launch shown on Exhibit 1? Yes, right here. Okay. And uh, the waterway that's shown on the uh, exhibit, what is that waterway? That is the Fox River. Now, is the parade route shown on uh, Exhibit 1? Sorry, Attorney Opperheim, one second. Mr. Brooks, just a reminder, you're not muted. Oh. All right. I'm sorry for the interruption. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, too. I, I thought I was muted. I apologize. That's okay. Thank you so much. Go ahead and point out the parade route, please. So the parade route in this map is essentially this, this purple line. Uh, this area here is the what I referred to earlier as a staging area. And then actually at this corner right here, um, westbound is where the parade route would follow down to the corner here. I refer to this as Veterans Park. That's that area there. And then it would turn up Wisconsin Avenue and end around the, the library right here, which is that green area. Now, can you um, describe for us where the road was actually shut off by police so that no motorists could actually travel down the road? Sure, I mean this uh, actually further north than here, it's off the map, um, is where we had our first point of shutdown. It was at White Rock Avenue and Niagara Street. Uh, we used Niagara Street to divert any traffic that um, would have come that direction. Um, so then along here, there would have been shut down at Niagara. There's another street called Perkins uh, where it was shut down. And then um, right here is Baxter Street where we had the street shut down. Um, additionally, here along the staging route, uh, North Hartwell Avenue here was shut down on, on both sides of it um, to ensure no traffic entered into the staging area while that space was occupied. Okay. All right, uh, please have a seat, sir. There are locations along the route here. At 1 p.m. is when the initial uh, few officers head out um, to secure the staging area. Um, so they're out there from 1 o'clock until about 3.30. Uh, between 3 and 3.30 is when the rest of the um, personnel assigned to the parade would have arrived at their locations along the route. All right. And there's somebody that's running the parade as far as lining up the participants and, and uh, making sure everybody that's... Uh, Walking in the parade is where they're supposed to be, correct? Correct. Is there a title for that person? Boy, I wouldn't know it. Well, your objection is noted. It's overruled. He may testify about the question asked. Or is there somebody that you were dealing with directly that was kind of responsible for the units of the parade and you're responsible for the security of the parade? Yes, there was a... Overruled. He may answer. 
there is a lady from the Chamber of Commerce who put on the parade um, that just prior to the parade starting, I had a face-to-face -face contact with to inform her that um, the route was ready for the parade. Now, how do you know that? How do you know that the route was ready to go? Um, between um, 3.30 and 4 o'clock, I had driven the route several times uh, within the parade route on the street that was shut down. Uh, it was my duty as the incident commander of the parade to make sure that the um, officers or personnel assigned to the parade were all in their location, that all the barricades were in place, uh, that there was no holes in the parade route that we missed um, in the planning, and as a, a final security sweep of, of the route just to ensure everything was in place as we had planned for it to be. Can you estimate how many spectators were present? At what time? Oh, I'm sorry, ahead. at the start of the parade. <coughs> Thousands. Um, I Once the parade had started, I was not on the route anymore. Um, you know, I think the last time I drove the route itself would have been just before 4 o'clock is my final lap through. Okay. And there's spectators on both sides of the road, north and south sides of Main Street? Correct. And all the way from uh, Hartwell all the way down to Veterans Park at the end there near Wisconsin Avenue? Yes, yeah, so I'd say the majority of this. Oh, hold on, there's been an objection. Go ahead. What's your objection? Uh, that is hearsay. We, how, we, we can't know uh, sure where everybody was at. The objection is noted. It is overruled based upon the foundation previously laid by the witness. Go ahead. The spectators are primarily um, from the intersection of White Rock and Main Street westbound. So you were satisfied it was uh, appropriate, appropriately safe to start the parade, is that right, sir? Yes. What did you do? I had face-to-face -face contact with the organizer of the parade. Um, I indicated to her that I, I checked the route and uh, from the police side of things that we were ready for the parade to proceed and um, let her know that she could begin whenever she was ready. About what time of day was that? It was right about 4 p.m. And uh, you had mentioned the units were staging on White Rock near where you were posted, is that right? Yes. And did you see... Um, as the units would enter the parade route, then they all kind of move forward, I'm assuming? Yes, the... Um, overruled. The parade participants are are set up on either side of White Rock Avenue, um, and they're kind of funneled together into almost a zipper-type fashion uh, as they enter the parade route. And as um, they march forward towards the parade route, then at some point, is the road behind them vacant? Correct. And what do you do when that happens? We try to cause as little disruption in the city, um, shutting down White Rock Avenue. It's a, a very major thoroughfare in the city, and having it shut down for that extended period of time causes some pretty significant traffic problems. So as the road is no longer occupied by um, parade participants, we try to open up the road um, from behind them, keeping the back of the parade shut down, um, always taking into account um, you know, a, a street for a car to turn off onto. So, Did you remain in that same position near um, White Rock and Hartwell? Yes. And uh, do you remember... Um, how you had your squad positioned? Objection, as you're saying. Overruled. I had my squad positioned across White Rock Avenue in an east-west fashion, um, essentially in the middle of the roadway. The road is much wider than um, the SUV squad I was driving is. Um, I positioned it that way to give a visual um, representation to motorists that the road wasn't open. And is your squad marked or unmarked? It is unmarked. Objection irrelevant. Um, it's relevant. The answer may stand. Make sure if you hear an objection, sir, that you wait until I rule on it, too. Thank you. Are there red and blue lights on your squad car, sir? Yes. Objection irrelevant. Overruled. The answer may stand.
Did you have your red and blue lights activated as it was parked across the roadway? Objection, irrelevant. Overruled. Yes. Do you remember hearing something about a disturbance uh, near the boat launch? <coughs> yes. Objection, hearsay. Um, are you offering it's it for the- foundational, Your Honor. Or it's not being offered for the truth of the matter. Sir, did the objection is overruled, he may answer. I believe he answered yes, and it may stand. All right. Um, what do you remember hearing about an incident at the boat launch? Uh, when I was at near my position on, on Hartwell and White Rock, I was speaking with one of our reserve officers. Uh, we were discussing the proper opening, timing, uh, the opening of the road. Um, and I, I overheard actually on his police radio that he was wearing um, squads that were not assigned to the parade being sent uh, to a fight uh, at Frame Park that involved knives. Were you aware of any vehicles being associated with that fight? Objection, irrelevant. Overruled, you may answer. I did not hear of any vehicles associated. What do you remember next, sir? I remember seeing and hearing squads responding to this um, this fight at Frame Park, um, and at that time uh, we were still focused on opening up the roadway. And I made my way back toward my my unmarked police vehicle, and I looked to my right or to the north down White Rock Avenue, and I saw a, a red SUV um, traveling toward me at a high rate of speed. What do you mean by a high rate of speed, sir? Objection, that's hearsay. Overruled, he may answer. I believe the vehicle is traveling in excess of 40 miles per hour. What's the posted speed limit there on White Rock Avenue? It's a 25 mile per hour zone. What about Main Street in downtown Waukesha? What's the posted speed limit there, sir? The speed limit is relevant. Overruled, it's relevant. The speed limit throughout the parade route is 25 miles per hour. What did you do when you saw this uh, red SUV traveling at a high rate of speed? Objection, leading the witness. Um, uh, the objection is noted, it's overruled. When I saw the red SUV traveling toward me at a high rate of speed, um, I used both hands and waved them overhead like this uh, in an attempt to catch the attention of the driver. Were you dressed in a police uniform, sir? Yes. Did the car continue in your direction, or the SUV? Yes, it did. What did you observe the path of travel for the SUV to be? Objection, that's hearsay. Mr. Brooks, it's not hearsay. Your objection is overruled. Can we answer? Could you state the question one more time? Sure. Where did you see the SUV go? Better question. Overruled. The SUV entered the parade route. I want you to describe what you remember seeing as it passed your location, please. Uh, as I was waving my hands overhead, I was approximately six feet um, from where the SUV was driving. Um, as the as the driver passed uh, essentially in front of me by about six feet, um, I could see the operator of the vehicle and a, a just a, a dazed straight focus look straight ahead um, not looking at anyone did the driver appear to respond to your efforts to stop the vehicle there is absolutely no response did the uh, did you notice the car slow down in any fashion no in fact it's not hearsay it's, not hearsay. it's overruled he may answer as the SUV passed me um, I looked over the the hood of or the top of the police vehicle that I had positioned on the road there, fully expecting that as it passed that the, I would see the car slam on its brakes as it realized it had entered the parade route, um, figuring it was a lost motorist. Um, I didn't see that happen. Um, it continued um, into the parade route at a, a high rate of speed. What did you do? Uh, upon seeing that, I got on my radio uh, in an attempt to notify other personnel assigned to the parade route. Uh, I, I stated that a red SUV had just blown by me. Do you remember using those exact words, sir? Objection, that's irrelevant. Overruled, he may answer. 
I don't know if I said a red or a maroon SUV, but I remember saying that it had blown by me. Were there um, parade units still on White Rock attempting to get onto the parade route at that point? Yes. Objection. Were you able to see the vehicle clearly as it went? I'm sorry. Objected. It's overruled. Go ahead. From where you were standing there, were you able to turn and watch the SUV as it traveled past you down White Rock towards Main Street? Objection. Overruled. Just asked it. I only watched it for a, a short period of time before returning to my squad car, um, knowing that some sort of police action was going to need to be taken. What did you do once you got to your squad? Uh, I got in my squad car. Um, it was bombarded with um, the most terrible um, Is the most terrible thing I ever heard. The sounds. Yes. You didn't see anything at that point as far as people getting hit? No. Okay. I want to show you a video clip, sir. Did you see that clip, sir? Yes. Is that uh, a video clip you've seen before? I have seen that, yes. Okay. Do you believe that's a true and accurate representation of the SUV traveling um, near White, I'm sorry, on White Rock Avenue near the start of the parade at Main Street? Yes. Move uh, for admission and permission to publish, Your Honor. <clears throat> Any objection, Mr. Brooks? Uh, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. The state just moved admission of Exhibit 2. Uh, I object to that. Keep it. All right. Um, the objections noted. It's overruled. Exhibit two, ladies and gentlemen, of the jury is received. Permission to publish is granted. Thank you, Sergeant Warner. Is that uh, consistent with the vehicle you saw um, traveling away from you past the parade floats that were about to enter the route? Yes. And is that consistent with the approximate speed you saw it traveling? Yes. After you became aware that something terrible was happening on the parade route, your incident commander, what do you do? Uh, I drove in my police vehicle down toward the area um, that is heard repeated over and over on the radio where the, the casualties had taken place, um, and that would have been at Maine and Gaspar. Um, and once I got to that position, I, I parked my vehicle as it was impossible to drive any further. Was there a call made for assistance? Yes, I don't know who said it, um, but an officer used a code um, over the police radio basically requesting police assistance from any officer in the county that would be listening. Did multiple officers respond? Yes. From within Waukesha County? Uh, from right. within. Overruled. Uh, Waukesha County and uh, far beyond. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other questions at this time. Mr. Brooks, do you have any qu questions for this witness? Yes, I do. Uh, good afternoon, Officer First off. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, I see this is very emotional, so I'm going to try my best not to keep you up there any, any longer than you would like to be. Um, 
Uh, first, my first question is, I, I noticed that you are in uniform today. Is it fair to say that um, if you weren't here testifying that you would have been on duty today? Is it fair to ask that or say that? Not at work today. So did you feel the testimony that you would be given at a uh, trial today warranted you to be in uniform? Objection, relevance, Your Honor. Sustained. You do not need to answer that, sir. Next question, Mr. Brooks. Uh, you said uh, you've been uh, uh, in the duty for 18 years, correct? Yes. Um, in any of those 18 years, um, have you ever um, come across or had any interaction with uh, the plaintiff in this matter? Objection, vague. Sustained. You do not need to answer that, sir. Next question, Mr. Brock. <clears throat> Um, how long have you known the plaintiff? Objection. Vague and irrelevant. Sustained. You do not need to answer that, sir. Next question, Mr. Brooks. Um, do you see the plaintiff in court today? Objection. Vague and irrelevant. Sustained. Next question. Do you have any knowledge of the plaintiff? Objection. Sustained. Do you, have you ever even seen the plaintiff in this matter? Same objection. Sustained. Um, I want to go to the clip that was just shown. Would you like um, it shown to the witness again and published to the jury? Um, I'm sure he, would he prefer for it to be so again? I just, I just want, want to know if that's what you were asking. You can certainly question him about it and if need be, it can be shown again. Okay, can you show the witness the video clip again? Sure. All right, your question, sir. Uh, in that clip, um, is it fair to say that you uh, can see that there are uh, people walking in the street and on the sidewalk? Would that be fair to say? Yes, I could see that in the video clip. Do you see the said driver of that vehicle intentionally trying to hit anyone in that video? No. So, uh, again, I would, I would ask, uh, were you brought here today to testify on behalf of the plaintiff? Objection, asked and answered. Uh, sustained. He already answered that he was why he's here. Again, I'll ask just one more time for the record. Do you see the plaintiff in court today? Objection. Sustained. Do you have any other questions, Mr. Brooks? Do you know of the plaintiff at all whatsoever? Objection. Sustained. No further questions. All right, thank you. Any redirect? No. All right, thank you, Sergeant. You may step down. Is he released from his subpoena? Yes, please. All right, thank you. He's released. Uh, yeah, really quick on the record, if I may. Um, we're going to call the next witness. Do you have a, we have the jury in the courtroom. Do you have a question, sir? Uh, I'll have a... Uh, Oral tennis motion I would like to, to be put on the record. If you have a motion, you'll have to wait until after the next witness is called. Write it down, submit it on paper, and I'll review whether it's appropriate for this court to address. All right, the state may call the next witness. The state calls Corey Runkle. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Runkle. Do you know a person named Erica Patterson? Yes. How do you know that person? Uh, from a shelter. What shelter are you talking about? Women's shelter. 
What city is the women's shelter in? Uh, Lakcha. And when did you meet Erica Patterson? Around probably October, I think. Okay. You are not used to testifying in court, right? Not really. And what were your living arrangements at the women's shelter? Uh, we were bunking together. You and Erica? Yeah. Okay. While you were bunking together with Erica at the women's shelter, did Erica ever talk about a boyfriend of hers? Uh, it wasn't her boyfriend. Okay. Did she ever talk about a man? Yeah. And what? did she ever provide the name of that man? Yeah. What was it? Daryl Brooks. Okay. Uh, were you with Erica on the afternoon of November 21st, 2021? Yes, until I split up with her. Okay, can you tell us where you were with Erica before you split up with her? I forgot what park it was, but we were at like the park where the dragonfly was, except for we were at the docks. Is that in Waukesha? Yeah. Okay, and uh, the docks, are you talking about a river? Yeah. So the park by the river? Yeah. Okay. What were you doing with Erica in the park? Hanging out. Okay. Was anybody with you? Yeah. Kyle. Okay. And you mentioned that you split up with Erica at some point. Is that right? Yeah. Do you remember why? To go hang out with Nick. Do you know Nick's last name? Uh, Kirby. Okay. And Erica didn't go with you? No. Okay. So what happened after you split up with Erica? Uh, she met up with Daryl. How do you know that? Uh, because she was on the phone with him and they said that they were going to meet up. Now, before that day, November 21st, had you ever met Daryl Brooks? No. You'd only heard his name from Erica? Yeah. Okay. After you split up with Erica and she went to hang out with Daryl, did Erica ever contact you, contact you or Nick after that point? Yeah. How did that contact take place? How did... Was it, again, did she like see you or did she call you? No, she happen? called me on my cell phone. Okay. And what was the nature of that conversation? Uh, that he was beating her up and he was following her. Okay. What did you do when you learned this information from Erica? Uh, me and Nick started running t um, to where she told us she was. Where was that? Uh, by the school. Okay. I forgot what school it was, but it was by the school. All right. Did you find her? Yeah. Do you remember where you found her? Uh, right in front of the school. Okay. Do you remember what was happening when you found her? Uh, he was swerving into her. When you say he, who are you talking oh, about? Oh, Daryl. Daryl, the person? Yeah. Okay. Did you hear... Uh, Daryl saying anything to Erica at that time? He was yelling at her to get back in the car. Okay. Did she? No. She tried, but I pulled her away. Okay. Uh, before you testified today, you reviewed a couple of surveillance videos. Is that right? Yeah. No, not today, but a while ago. A while ago, not yeah. today. I'd like to put Exhibit 3 up on the screen for the witness for identification. So, Ms. Ruckel, we're going to play a few moments from this video. I want you to watch and see if it's the same video that you've reviewed previously. Okay, so we're just going to play about 10 seconds here. I could just tell that's her walking up. Okay, uh, let's pause there. So, you viewed this video. Is it an accurate depiction of how the events unfolded in front of the school you're talking about? Yeah. I move Exhibit 3 into evidence and ask to publish. Any objection, Mr. Brooks? Uh, yeah, my, my objection would be uh, you've only played five seconds of the video, whereas the other five, you just said ten seconds that you would play. I'm curious to see the rest of the video. Um, your objection is noted. It's overruled. This is for foundation uh, to establish it's what the witness is going to testify about. She's testified. It's a fair and accurate depiction of what of the events that unfolded in her presence. And um, I will receive Exhibit 3. Permission to publish is granted. All right, we're going to hit play.
play from the beginning. There's his car. Let's hit a pause. Okay. Let's hit pause. We are at 16 seconds. We saw a person wearing a blue shirt walking from the left. Do you know who that person is? Erica. Erica Patterson? Yeah. And when you you said, there's his car, what car were you referring to? The red one. The and SUV. do you know who was driving that car? Daryl. Daryl Brooks? Yeah. Okay. And again, this would have been the first time you ever saw Daryl Brooks. Is yeah. that correct? Okay. Um, we're going to resume from that point, but wait until I pause again to speak again, okay? I'm sorry. That's okay. So we'll, we'll play from 16 seconds. Let's pause there. <coughs> pause at 2 minutes and 44 seconds. During that clip, we saw the a red SUV towards the top of the screen, is that right? Yeah. And did you recognize that vehicle? Yeah, that was Daryl's. Okay. Yeah. We see now at this stoppage point, we can see two people on the upper right hand corner. Do you know who those people are? Uh, me and Nick. Do you know which one you are? Uh, the one with the green gloves. So, left or right? Uh, I think As we're looking, the one up in front. And then there's a person with a white hood. Do you know yeah, who that that's, is? Yeah, that's Nick. Okay, so you're the other one on the left? Yeah. Alright. And uh, you saw Erica? Yeah. Alright, let's resume playing at 2 minutes and 44 seconds. Let's pause there. Pause to three minutes and 19 seconds. Who's the person in the gray hooded sweatshirt? That's Daryl. Uh, the objections overruled for answer my stand. That's Daryl. How far away would you say you your face was from Daryl's face at this point in the video? I was chesting up. Chesting up? So yeah. I guess that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, do you see Daryl Brooks uh, either in the courtroom or on any monitors in the courtroom right now? Yeah. Your Honor, and actually for this point I would ask that the court order the defendant to remove his mask. Mr. Brooks, you're ordered to remove your mask. No, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Mr. Brooks? We talked about this uh, at a prior hearing. Uh, for purposes of identification, your order to unmask. Thank you, sir. So now I'll re-ask that question. Uh, Mr. Runkle, do you see Daryl, the person you're talking about in the video, either in the courtroom or on a monitor in the courtroom? Yes. Can you tell us where? Uh, in the orange. On the monitor in front of Yeah. You. I'd ask the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. The record will so reflect. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. You can remask. Let's hit play and resume at 3 minutes and 19 seconds. reached the end. Uh, Ms. Runkle, can you tell us what was happening in that last portion of the video we just watched? Well, before Erica, me, and Nick showed up in the camera, that's when I ran after Erica from 
getting ran over and then she tried to jump in the car with him and then I, I ended up chesting up to him and then we ended up going at it so yeah how would you describe the level of your volume during that interaction like what do you mean were you yelling I'd say yeah was Mr. Brooks yelling? Yeah. Was anybody else in, in that video, either Nick or Erica, were they yelling? Erica was telling, uh, telling me to stop. Okay. And what happened after the physical confrontation with Mr. Brooks? Uh, Nick pulled me away. And then what happened? And then uh, Brooks walked off. Did you see where he went? Into his car. The red SUV in the video yeah. we just watched? Was there anybody else in the SUV at that point that you saw? No. And what happened next? After that, it was like he headed out. Okay. Did Mr. Brooks say anything to you or Erica or Nick as he was leaving? He told Erica he was... Oh. Um, the basis for your objection, you said objection, right? Is, is, is hearsay and irrelevant? <laughs> um, is it being offered for the truth of the matter, certain? Well, it's a statement by a party opponent, so it's not yourself. Oh, it's his statement. Sorry. Um, this, I think I misheard what she said. All right. Um, the objection is overruled. Um, if it's, uh, She may testify as to words that you spoke on this occasion. Go ahead. He told Erica that he was going to find her and he was going to kill her. Can we pull up uh, Exhibit 5 for the witness, please? Uh, did you at any point come into contact with police or a police officer after Mr. Brooks left the scene that we just watched? Uh, I forgot what that guy was at, the little stoppers, like where it stopped everybody. But we came into contact with him, and then he called called the police officer, and then we had contact with the police officer. Okay. Uh, at any point while Mr. Brooks was still d present for the scuffle, did you or anybody else in your group call the police? No. All right, Ms. Runkle, I'm showing you on your monitor a photograph that's been marked as State Exhibit Number 5. Do you recognize that photograph? Yes. Who's in that photograph? Erica. Erica Patterson? Is that an accurate representation of how Erica looked the night of November 21st, so after the Waukesha Christmas Parade? Yes. I'd move Exhibit 5 into evidence and ask to publish. Any objection? Yep, on the grounds of uh, that he's hearsay. The objection's noted. It's overruled. Uh, exhibit 5 is received. Permission to publish is granted. Were you with Erica Patterson the day before the parade, so November 20th? Yes. Did she have a swollen left eye on November 20th? No. I want to go back to the issue of uh, police and whether or not you had contact with them. Um, can you describe in a little bit more detail what exactly happened with law enforcement <laughs> after the defendant left the scene that we just watched? Um. I'm not sure where we walked, but like I think we walked straight down to the parade. I'm not sure, but um, we stopped at these like stoppers where there was this. Um, I don't know what he's called. It's not a cop, but he was like a guard, and he ended up calling. No, we ended up telling him that um, what happened. That Erica almost got ran over. I had to pull pull him, pull her away from the car, and um, he ended up calling the cops. He told us, "Hold on, let me call the cops." And a cop came, and we started talking to him. Okay, but you don't, or do you remember the name of the officer that you spoke with? I do not. Okay, that's all the questions I have for this witness. All right, Mr. Brooks, do you have any questions for this witness? I sure do. So. Um 
my first question would be uh, you seem to be unclear about when you met Erica um, would you say it was roughly October or November because you wasn't sure which one R roughly in between roughly in between yeah um, I know it was before so Christmas do you well you just said that you had never seen her quote unquote boyfriend or whoever she was referring to as that before the Chris Christmas parade is that correct that was the Christmas parade was November, right? He's and asking you if you had seen not the not before, but the Christmas parade was November. I'm just asking, right? Okay, so no. Did, did hmm. she? Do you wanted to restate her answer? She answered. Uh, um, she confirmed I'll, her question. I wanted to be direct. Okay, no, I have not. So you just testified that you can identify who was driving the said vehicle as soon as you saw the video played if you've never seen the driver before that day how would you even know who it was i'll object that is not a clear question this is just going to confuse the witness it's confused me um i'll sustain it mr brooks rephrase the question please um would you play the video again the first 10 seconds I, i'm guessing that it was now you just said you just testified it's, not, it's playing you want it to stop now stop okay you you just, the first 13 seconds for, for the witness. <clears throat> thank you you just testified that as soon as as soon as you saw the vehicle come into the camera view you said oh there's his car how would you know whose car it was if you've never seen this person before that day can you understand the question yeah go ahead and answer because i was told that she was going to meet up with their brooks you were told this directly from Erica. Yes. Did at any time she ever tell you what kind of car he had and what kind of car he would be meeting up with her with, quote unquote? No. So how can you identify that it was the said person's car if you had no knowledge of what vehicle this said person would be driving or who the person even was or who the per what the person even looked like? How would you know? Because I was told it was Daryl Brooks. What is your name? Brooks. And so you were told that it was this name, but you were able to identify the vehicle and the person on the first day that you ever saw them. Objection. Is that yes, and answered. Let him finish his question. As soon as the car came into camera view, you immediately said on the record just a few minutes ago, oh, there's his car. Who was the, who is his, who are we, who were you referring to? Daryl Brooks. What is your name? Brooks. And you would be able to know that that was quote unquote Daryl Brooks just by seeing the car come into the view of the camera? Now I'll apologize based on an asked and answered question. Sustained. Mr. Brooks, are you trying to ask her whether at the moment in time she first saw the SUV, did she know who was driving? That would be a relevant question. Did you know who was driving the SUV that you saw when you saw it? Not in court, but when you first saw it on that date. Yes, because I don't see why Erica would be talking to anybody else and getting yelled at by well, someone else. But did you know at that moment who was driving the car? Yes. And how would you know that you just said that you had no knowledge of 
the vehicle that whoever Erica was meeting up with would be driving. So how would you know that? Objection asked and answered and argumentative. Yeah. Her answer previously, Mr. Brooks, was she's basing that on what someone told her, not based on what she saw at that point. That's at least how I took it. So Erica told you the vehicle and how the vehicle would look? Do you understand the question? Say that again. Mr. Brooks. Erica. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Restate the question, sir. So let's back up a little bit. Erica told you that she was meeting up with this Daryl Brooks, correct? That's what you said, right? Correct. And did she at any time tell you what vehicle this person would be driving and how the vehicle looked? She did not. So the first time you saw the vehicle, did you know who was driving the vehicle? Yes, when she told me. When she told me. What he's asking you though is did you know based on personal observation? Oh, not no, based not on personal what observation. So let's just make sure the record's clear what your answer is. It's, it's, it's based on what I was told when I met her, up with her. So it was told. It, that's been established. I, it's been established what was told. So next question. No, I was, I was going to a different question. I didn't get to it. All right, well then ask it, please. I'm trying to. So you were told after the vehicle drove away and you and Erica were alone, is that when you were told? Yes. So it would be fair to say that before you were told this, after the vehicle drove away, you did not know who was driving the vehicle, correct? Would that be fair to say? Oh, I had a suspicion it was Daryl. You had a suspicion or did you know? Had a suspicion until I asked so you her. Didn't know. Okay. Yeah, so we've kind of been a little bit circular here. So the objection is sustained. I think we need to be clear, Mr. Brooks, when you ask your questions about what point in time. It's one thing to talk about when she first sees the vehicle because there's been no contact between her and the vehicle, but it's a different point in time when it's later. So you need to make clear at what point in time you're referring to so that your question is clear. Gotcha. Um, you uh, identified the alleged defendant in court. Would that be fair to say? Yes. And the alleged defendant that you identified was the same person that you saw driving the vehicle that day? Yes. The video also shows that, well, let me back up. As a matter of fact, let me ask a different question. You made reference to hanging out with Erica in a park, correct? Yes. With maybe one other person present? Yes. Hanging out, what were you guys actually doing? Drinking. So would it be fair to say that because of alcohol being involved that there may have been a misinterpretation of what you saw? No. What you thought you saw? Objection calls for speculation. The question, the way it's asked, calls for speculation. If you could please rephrase it. Oh, I ask it different. How much were you drinking? Was it a few beers, a bottle? Half a pint. Half a pint. Do you remember what you were drinking? Vodka. Do you remember if Erica was drinking? 
she was. And you said that you separated at one point to go hang with another person. I can't remember the, the name, but would that be fair to say that you separated from Erica to go hang out with another person? I did say that. Um, was that person also drinking that day? No. Did that person overhear any conversation between you and Erica? No. Would that be the same person that was saw in the video? Yes. So that would be... Uh, Nick? Is that fair to say? Yes. And is it true that you did give a statement about um, what you saw and heard that day? Would yes. That be fair to say? Would it be fair to say that in this statement that you gave, you never mentioned um, the person that you saw driving make any threats? Would that be fair to say? I never mentioned. Well, I have I have the, the statement right here in front of me. Would it be fair to say that the statement that you gave that day that you did not say in your statement that you heard any threats being made or yelled towards Erica. Would that be fair to say? Possibly. So do you remember giving a statement? I remember giving a statement. Do you remember what you said in your statement? I do. So I'm going to ask you again because I just asked. <laughs> I have your statement in front of me. You did not mention any threats being yelled or made towards Erica. Would that be fair to say? I did mention some. What exactly did you mention? Uh, that you were yelling at her, saying that you were going to kill her and to get in the car. And that's in your statement? Yes. Would you like me to read your statement to you? Yes. You sure? Yeah, sure. So I'll object based on the procedure that the defendant is employing at this point. Sure. Uh, Mr. Brooks, I, there is a procedure. Um, I can have the state bring up her statement, I hope, electronically to show her. Um, it would, that and would then, fine, all right. You'll want to direct her to what part. You will you can ask her to review it, ask her if that refreshes her recollection, and then you can ask her a question. Or even show her that and ask a direct question about it would be another way. When will I be allowed to come back into the court so I can see everything? You have earned your right to come back, sir. I mean, I can bring you back if you want to finish your questioning here. I do. All right, we'll take a short break for you to do that. All right, I'll have to excuse the jury's jury for a moment. Uh, we'll be in recess as far as the cameras are concerned for that. Then before we bring out the jury, if we need to talk a procedure or Attorney Wichow, if there was something you wanted to address. Thank you. Uh, there is. I think there may have been some misunderstanding on the nature of this statement in question. This witness provided a statement to a police detective who then wrote a police report summarizing the statement. So the proper method at this point for the defendant would be to confront her by orally quoting from that, asking if she said or didn't say these things. To show her this statement isn't, isn't we're not refreshing her recollection. She didn't write this. Ah, uh, I see. So I didn't know that, but that certainly uh, makes a lot of sense. Mr. Brooks, did you hear what Attorney Mitchell just said about the procedure? Is it a way to verify that that is, in fact, procedure? Just just to be clear for the record. Can you I verify it? I had referenced earlier that I thought you were trying, It might we might be showing her the statement to help refresh her recollection, but I don't have any of the statements in front of me, and I wasn't aware that it's uh, the police report that may be referenced as 
Um, and it's, she wrote a statement apparently, but the police report is a summary of her statement. So. So how we. That kind of make that kind of makes it problematic, though. You you could probably see what I'm getting at, Your Honor, by if it's a summary of what she said. There do may, you have the statement that of what? Do you have a written statement of hers? Yes, yeah, I'm trying to get back to it. You know, I got a lot of stuff coming over. I know. <laughs> so at this point, I don't need to show it to her, but you can ask questions. We'll bring the jury back out, and you can continue. Would would this be left up for me to see, though? Wow. We can leave it up. We can leave it up. Okay. Do you, is the part that's up sufficient, or do you need to scroll up? A, do you, does the state need to scroll up a little bit for you? I would only need this part that's on my screen now. Okay. And then you stroll. Whoever's strolling, stroll down a little bit past that to the second part. Up. How about that? Uh, you should be able to see both parts now. Starts with in summary near the top. Yeah. And then the, that's page two of five, and then down below, presumably it says three of five, but I'd like to bring the jury okay. out, so let me know when you're ready. Okay, that, I'm ready. All right, let's have the jury brought back in. Mr. Brooks, you're doing a good job at I'm, I'm coming up with questions and following the process, and I appreciate you asking to come back over here. All right, thank you, everyone. Please be seated. All right, Mr. Brooks, when you're ready, please continue with your cross-exam. Okay. give everybody time to settle back in for a few seconds okay. so uh, miss is it Runkle it is um, you stated earlier um, that when you were hanging out with Erica at the at the park that you were drinking right I did and you also stated that you guys separated and you went to go hang out with someone else. Which, with Nick, yes. With Nick. Um, you, did, you did state that Nick wasn't drinking, right? Yes. Um, so, I want to ask... Earlier, when I asked... Uh, well, I think you were asked by uh, Attorney Witchild if um, you heard any yelling or anything being yelled at Erica or I'll, I'll forget how you phrased the question but did you hear any yelling or anything directed towards you you guys and do you remember what you said uh, I heard that you were yelling at Erica telling her to get in the car and that you were going to kill him kill her that was the, the, the you were going to kill her was after the fact that you headed up, but that's probably not what you're asking. The I, fact of you were yelling at her, telling her to get in the car, was the time when you were around. Oh, I mean, sorry, Brooks was around. Brooks or you? You said you, said you and then you said Brooks. Brooks. But you did state that you had never seen Brooks before November 21st of 2021. Would that right. be fair to say? Right. And you also did say that you had only heard of him through Erica, correct? Right. Um, at any time, did you ever observe any phone conversations or interactions between Erica and Brooks? Am I allowed to answer that? He's just asking you whether you have not the content of any of those. I have. Um, would it be fair to say that you knew uh, a lot of details about their relationship? Would that be fair to say? I did. Um, what is specifically did you know before November 21st, 2021? Mr. Brooks, I'm sure you want to ask that question. Think about some of the pretrial rulings I've made. Let me rephrase that. Okay, good idea. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just new. Um, so, 
So you're in your statement that I'm looking at right here on the screen, it says, it is Runkle, right? Yes. I don't want to mispronounce your name. It says, Runkle further stated that she heard Brooks telling Erica he was going to smash her face in and that he was going to kill her. Yes. That, I didn't. I didn't I'm sorry. Know. Is that what you heard? Yes. So you didn't hear what you just testified to hearing? No. Or did you I, hear or did you hear what I just read to you? I heard that after you were leaving. After not that what you just read, I heard that after you were leaving. You do know that this is your your statement that I'm reading from, right? Okay. I do. We've established that and this is argumentative. It's the same. Refresh. I'm I'm trying to figure out which one did you hear. Objection, vague. Did you hear the I'm gonna I'm going to smash your face in, or did you hear what you previously said? Well, I heard when you were sitting there arguing with her. I heard that. Who is the you you're referring to? Oh, I'm sorry. Brooks said that. When he was arguing with Erica. What is your name? And you claim that you, it says right here, but through knowing Patterson, she did know that Brooks was Erica Patterson's boyfriend. Did she ever tell you that Brooks was her boyfriend? She said you were, oh, I'm sorry, she said Brooks was her ex. I'm a little confused by the statement and then the, the testimony right now. Objection. That's not a question. Uh, sustained. Mr. Brooks, you need to formulate a question for the witness. Did okay? you ever hear, man, this is coming from your statement. Runkle stated that after a short dispute between her, Kirby, I guess that would be referring to Nick. Yes. After a short dispute between her, Kirby, and Brooks, she saw Brooks get back into the red SUV and heard him saying something to the effect of, I don't swear, so F you, effing bees, you're dead. Did you at any time hear anything like that? Yes. So when you just testified, why did that part of your statement never come up. Why did you never say that? Because it probably wasn't brought up at that time, but it's in my memory. So what all exactly did you hear? I heard what you what you well, were saying. You heard you say at this time? Like the question's with, not with clear all, to me. Like what time frame? With, Who are we talking about? When because in the video is is clear that. Uh, Hold on, go back to your question. I didn't mean for you to not ask it. I just want to make sure I understand um, specifically who you're asking this witness about statements that were made. I'm asking about who she said was the individual driving the vehicle. That's different than what you just asked. So if well, you want to change and go to that, that's gave, fine. You just clarified it a little bit. So what exactly did you hear coming from the individual who was driving the vehicle? Please, I'm sorry. Can we just clarify at what point we're talking exactly. about? Exactly. At the point that um, you... I guess I would refer back to the video at that point that we saw on the video. So what point of the video? There's lots of points. Um, it was many minutes long. Roughly, um, I'm not sure. I think it was. Can you describe what part of the video you want? The part to of the video, about? the part of the video when um, that she testified to where she said she had the green gloves and so she was standing in. The beginning she was of the standing video? In, no, it was like towards the middle. She was standing in the street. 
and she said she had the green gloves because I think somebody asked her which one was she. Right. And she I said the that. one with the green gloves. I remember that. At that point, did you observe anything being said out of out of said vehicle? Did you hear anything being yelled or screamed or anything like that at that point? Well, before I showed up, I heard yelling. You heard yelling before you showed up? Yeah, because like before I showed up into the video. So how far were you down the street that you were able to hear what was being said? Not. Calls for a fact, not an evidence. She didn't say what she heard what she said. She didn't say she could understand what was said. Uh-huh. She can answer the question. I'm going to overrule it. I, I understand what the state is saying, but I think he's trying to establish where she was at that point in time. So go ahead and answer. Now, where's the where? Okay. I was right where I was right where you pulled up the second time. Are you sure you know what I was asking? It was not entirely clear to maybe all of us, but I was trying to give you some leeway. So I knew you understood where where I was going with that. Um, were you at a? Let me say it like this: Were you at a distance before you came into that video? Like approximately how far away were you from the vehicle and from Erica before you heard anything being yelled or screamed? As you said, I was at a distance. So would it be fair to say that it would be hard to hear the conversation that was being had? Mm, not really. Brooks was yelling pretty loud. So you were able to hear the gist of the conversation from the distance that you were at? Yes. Even with a parade going on and a street full of people, you were able to hear from a distance, which you just said you were at a distance, you were able to hear the gist of the conversation. The parade was nowhere close. Answer the question. Were you able to hear? Oh, yes, sorry. You were able to hear even testifying that you were drinking vodka. Yes. What else did you hear? At what point and by whom? At the same point. What did you hear from Erica at that point? I don't remember. But you remember hearing something from the driver of the vehicle who was inside of the car. Yep. But you don't remember what you heard from Erica who was outside of the car and would be oh, more okay. easier to hear. Okay. Uh, thank you for being specific at, at that. I remember Erica sitting there telling me that she wanted to go. So she was telling you that from you being at a distance? No, she was right next to me. That was when she was walking towards. She said, come on, let's go. At what point was, was that because you just testified that you were at a distance? Objection, argumentative. I'm also going to object to the manner in which this defendant is asking this witness these questions. He's intentionally misleading her. He's trying to confuse her. Mr. Brooks, the purpose of cross-examination uh, is to ask questions that are relevant, test her credibility, other things like that. Um, it gets to be a little confusing, um, at times maybe a little argumentative. I don't have all the reports in front of me so i can't say whether it's misleading or not but ask a direct question you're able to ask leading questions so that she can answer directly be as specific as you can time place circumstances it's helpful for all i mean the video is very clear that um but you can't testify right now, right? You can't make an argument yeah. about the video. So your opinion yeah. about it right now, that's I'm, not appropriate. I want to... Keep going. For the record, the objection was sustained. Um, you made a reference to being, uh, well, a reference to chesting up 
with the driver of the vehicle. What was said at that point between you and who you were chesting up with? Uh, well, I'm not going to go back to that. But, um, I was sitting there saying that you shouldn't be hitting a woman. No, Brooks should not be hitting a woman. And Brooks was saying that Erica Patterson is not a woman. Are you sure that's what you heard? At that moment when you were chesting up in your words? Yes. You sure that's what you heard? Yes. What then happened from that point? Then we started brawling it out. Oh, me and Brooks started brawling it out. What do you mean by brawling it out? No, oh, threw a couple punches. I I threw I threw a punch. I, I'm Brooks smacked me. Hmm. So did you put that in the report that you made or the summary of the report that you gave to I think it was attorney which y'all said a detective. Objection, there's no reference. This witness prepared a report or a summary. This is me. Did you report that in your report? It's something that's in my it's in my memory, but I hope I did. Would it be fair to say that if you had just had a brawl with someone and you talked to police directly after the brawl that you were reported, would that be fair to say? I was t I, I was t um okay. I know you're asking a question, but Hold on, you need to ask, you do need to ask. Okay. You do need to answer his question. It called for a yes or no answer. Okay, it's not in the report. It's, it, I paused, no, I specifically said. Hold on, I have a question oh, though. Okay, so that's okay. Um, ask your next question. Would it be fair to say by the video footage that there was no brawl or punches thrown by either party? Would that be fair to say? There was. Can we show the witness the video again? Are you asking her whether the video shows a brawl? Would it be fair to say that the video shows a brawl in which you just said that punches were thrown? That'd be fair to say. Okay, so what's a brawl to you? Oh, you can't. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Okay, I think well. What, hold on. Mr. Brooks, are you trying to ask whether she, are you going to confirm with her that she saw the video and then on that video, there's, you cannot see a brawl between her and Mr. Brooks. Is that what you're trying to get at? A version of that, yes, but I was You got to ask the questions. I was going to say, that. can the video be shown to her again? <laughs> Ask your questions, sir. In the video that you saw, would it be fair to say that a brawl was not depicted on that video? Would that be fair to, fair to say? What's depicted? Can you see it in the video? Is that what yes. you mean? That's what I mean. Yes, I can see it. You can see the brawl? Yeah. It's, I, don't, I say it's a brawl. It's just a couple, it's just like a push, it looks like a push, but it was a smack. And I got up and, yeah. You you got up, so you- I got knocked, up and swung. You were knocked to the ground? No. So where did you get up from? From being pushed and smacked. So you fell to the ground? I didn't Jackson, fall to the ground. Answer. Sustained. Next question, sir. So would it be fair to say that in the video it shows you being knocked to the ground? It was not knocked to the ground. I, I staggered back. Would it be? I, I got kind of thrown off for a second. You and me both. <laughs> I, People need to make sure their phones and other electronics are... Not 
would, would it be fair to say that the video does not show you being knocked to the ground at any point? Would that be a fair assessment? So I'll object to relevance because the witness never testified that she was knocked to the ground. So this is not a question aimed at her credibility. She just said she got knocked to the ground. She did not. Um, she I, said she got up. I'm sorry. She said she got up, which would constitute being, if well, you're not knocked to the ground or down, war you can't get up. Here, Mr. Brooks, I, she I'm was, sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. No, she was clear. Um, I think she clarified what it meant by getting up, and it might mean something different to you than it does to her. Um, but we need to keep going. So, um, what, can I ask what that what what is getting up what does getting up mean to you stagger back so it would be it would be fair to ask you then does the video show you staggering back it does does it show you being as you called it smacked it does can we can we show her the video again go ahead play the video You can, you can stop. Yeah, that's, that's All right, what's the time for the stopping of the video, please? Three minutes and 47 seconds. You just viewed the video again. Would that be fair to say? I did. At any time in that video, were you in fact smacked and staggered back? Can I tell the exact time? If you know, yes, go ahead. At 3.23. Can we see 323? 24. Okay. So we went from about 319 to 327. Thank you. Your question regarding the video, my, sir? My, my question again would be the same question. We just, you just saw it again. In the portion of the video you just saw, would it be fair to say Your part, your interpretation, that you were in fact smacked and staggered back. Yes. Next question. Were, are you sure you weren't over exaggerating that? No. It looked like a push. Objection Sustained. Would you say again what happened directly after that? Directly after the smack? Directly after what you say is the smack. Staggered back. No, directly after the whole, that whole incident. I, I call it get up, but I, I came back, came back and swung. Would it be fair to say that the video doesn't show any of that that you just said? Would that be fair? It shows it sometime, one, no, somewhere. So would it be fair that you're saying your interpretation of what you just saw would constitute a brawl, as you say, or brawling it out, as you say? As you say? Uh, hold on, Mr. Brooks. I've given you a lot of leeway on this topic. What's the relevance of all of this at this point? I think you made your point about what that... happened and what didn't and what's in the video and what's not. And the jury can ultimately decide that. You can argue it I'm, later on to the I'm jury. I'm sorry, I thought this state Where are we going? was to object to that. If they saw an objection, I'm a little well, confused about that. I, I need the questioning to kind of circle back to what's relevant for the trial. Um, well, I thought it was relevant because of what the video is actually depicting. 
and that video is going to speak for itself. It's been an exhibit. Yes, it does. And so we've, you've asked a lot of questions about it. So let's move on. Under 90611, that's my authority. I'm telling you to move forward. Next line of Did question. you hear anything after the, as you say, brawling out? Did you hear anything coming from the vehicle? Was anything said to you directly coming from the vehicle at that point? Would it be after you leave? Oh wait, Brooks leaves. Or I just, when I was, Brooks gets I was clearing gets in. what I just asked after the brawling but it you, out. But you asked directed at her, and then you said anything from the vehicle. So that's a compound question. So you need to be specific. Did you hear anything after the brawling it out? As you say, did you hear anything directed towards you? Directed towards me? No. Did you hear anything directed towards Nick? I remember something being said. Do you recall what, what was said? I do not. Did you hear anything directed towards Erica? Yes. What did you hear directed towards Erica? At what time? Right after the brawling it out, as you say. Did you hear anything directed specifically towards Erica? Not till Brooks left. So, did you or did you not hear anything directed towards Erica after the brawling it out, as you said? Oh, okay, no. So, can we pull that statement up again? I'm, I'm referring, I'm reading directly from the statement um, where it says, Mr. Brooks, May or may not be a statement, so you need to be accurate. I know you're referring the, the to the summary. Report. The summary of the statement. I'm reading directly from the summary of the statement, where it says Runkle stated that after a short dispute between her Kirby and Brooks, she saw Brooks get back into the red SUV and heard him saying something to the effect of "F you, effing bees, you're dead." As he was leaving. So I'll check on two grounds. One, Aston answered, and two, this could confuse the witness because it's not a direct, it's not, she used the F and the B. Sustained. It was something on the back end of that that I didn't get to. I'm not sure what you mean by that, sir, but the, was, you've already asked, you've already asked that question before, so the objection is sustained. I actually didn't, don't recall asking a question directly to, to that part of the summary. I do. You read through that previously. Do you remember what the question was so that I don't re-ask the same question? Mr. Brooks, move on. Did you ever hear something to the effect of F U F and B's you're dead? I did. At what point did you hear that? While Brooks was leaving. So that would with that would it be fair to say that you heard that after the brawling yes. it out? You shook your head. Can you say yes? It? Thank you. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's a little confusing. So, Mr. Brooks, that's not a question. You're attempting I'm, to I'm testify. I'm about to ask a question you if can't I can do get that. to it. Ask your question. But you also can't mischaracterize the testimony or the evidence up to this point. I, what do you mean? You're, in your questions, you can't mischaracterize prior testimony or evidence. You have to be accurate. So I'm, I'm trying to be, but it's... What's your next question, sir? Kind of hard. Um, just a quick second. All right, unless you have a it, different topic. It, anything, it is. Hold it on. Is. Um, anything related to this, uh, what's in the summary, uh, the questions regarding what she heard or didn't hear around here around this time, That's we've gone through that, you've gone through it. Um, under 906.11, uh, 
um, you need to move on and ask a new line of questions. I was trying to, if I can get to it. Go ahead. This part of the summary that I'm looking at now says Runkle stated that she did see pictures of Brooks following the Christmas parade incident via social media. And Runkle confirmed that that was Brooks was the, well, I don't know, it looks kind of, I don't know if that's a mark on my screen that's going through, okay. I couldn't read it. I'm, I don't think there was a question there. Right. I didn't, I didn't get to it yet. Well, then I'll object to the ongoing commentary with lack of any questioning. And I'll sustain that objection. Oh, I do have a question. That's, I do have a question. Um, you said that you had known um, Erica roughly since you were roaming up at the women's shelter. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Um, do you have any idea why she would refer to you as Corey Gray? Because I go by that. So how well, or how close were you, would you say you guys were? Close. Um, close like hung out all the time, every day? Yes. Do you know of any any time before uh, November the 21st of 2021? Do you know of any time before that that uh, Erica mentioned to you anything about the relationship that she had with Brooks outside of what you learned that day? Can you say that again? At any time before November 21st of 2021, did Erica ever confide any information to you before that day? She did. Um, what was the nature of the, uh, the information? It's not allowed to be brought up. I think she's referring to a pretrial ruling that she's aware of. Yeah. So, you want to rethink asking that question, sir? Otherwise, what, I'm going to allow her to answer it. What pretrial? Uh, I'm not going to state. Uh, no, that I'm not. Right now. Are we both privy to the same pretrial procedure? There was a pretrial ruling about. Do you want her to answer that question or do you want to move on? I want to move on. All right, I'll strike that question from the record. The jury will disregard the question that was asked. Um, during the uh, brawling, brawling out uh, point, was there any interaction between the driver of the vehicle and Nick? There was. Do you remember what the nature of that interaction or, or exchange was between those two? I don't know. I just remember jumping in front. Do you recall uh, any threats being made towards Nick or from Nick towards the driver of the vehicle? Oh, I do. Relevance. Overruled, she may answer. I do. Do you remember what was said specifically? Not specifically, but I remember Brooks getting mad because Nick was coming to Erica's rescue. Right along with Corey. Me. Do you recall uh, any knife being involved in any of that situation no during knife. that exchange whatsoever? No knife. 
were you aware that that was why police was responding to that incident? I did not. Did you at any time have a knife during that incident? I did not. Do you know if Nick had a knife or, during that incident? He did not. Do you know if Erica had a knife toward, uh, sorry. Do you know if Erica had a knife during that incident? She did not. Do you recall reporting that a knife was involved in that incident? I do not. Do you recall if Nick reported a knife being involved in that incident? It's possible. Do you recall Erica reporting that a knife was involved in that incident? I do not. Um, you you testified to um, drinking a half pint of vodka that day. Um, was that the only thing you had to drink that day? Yes. Um, would it be fair to say that you were tipsy? Yes. Would it be fair to say that you may even have been intoxicated? No. For any reason, that day, acknowledging that you were drinking, would that have impaired your thinking of the situation in any way? No. So, would it be fair to say that you were of clear and sober mind during that whole incident after drinking a half pint of vodka? Yes. So there, to the best of your memory, there wouldn't be any reason why you may have left something out or maybe not been clear about anything that happened during that specific incident? Possibly left some things out. Do you remember what they might have been? No. Um, do you do you know the plaintiff? Objection for previous reasons. Sustained. Have you ever seen the plaintiff? Objection. Sustained. Have you ever had any interaction with the plaintiff? Objection. Sustained. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Let me redirect. Very, very briefly, Your Honor. Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Runkle, you met with Detective David Van Els to provide a statement on November 22nd of 2021. Do you remember that? Yes. That's, that's accurate? Yes. Okay. Do you remember telling Detective Van Els when he was asking you about this incident? That when you arrived, you heard Daryl Brooks telling Erica Patterson that he was going to, quote, smash her face in and that he was going to kill her, end quote. Yes. Okay. Do you remember telling Detective Van Els that um, as you saw Brooks get back into the red SUV, you heard him say something to the effect of, quote, fuck you, fucking bitches, you're dead, end quote. I do. Okay. During your cross-examination... Uh, you repeatedly referred to a person as Brooks. The person depicted in the video, Exhibit 3, the person that you chested up to, is that person in the courtroom? He is. Can you point him out for us and just very clearly tell us where he's sitting, what he's wearing? You want me to point? Yes, please. All right, he's right there and he's wearing orange. I'd ask the record to reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. It will. And I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this will be an excellent stopping point for us this evening. Thank you for your patience. With that, you are excused. I will provide information uh, to Pete and Mike shortly as to what time uh, we will start back up tomorrow. Thank you. All rise for the jurors. Mr. Brooks, I want to commend you for a couple of things. Number one, asking to come back into the courtroom. I really appreciate that. I appreciate you being here. I think it runs 
uh, much smoother when you are here, assuming you follow all the rules, which you have done a very good job at this afternoon. I also want to commend you on uh, cooperating with the process even before you were uh, brought over here. You were respectful. Um, but you also made appropriate objections. You asked questions on cross-examination. Uh, despite not wanting to unmask at first, you did do that, and I appreciate that. Um, you asked some cogent, relevant questions, some of which went directly to the credibility of the witness. I would add, you might not always artfully ask the questions, but I think you're making some solid points. Um, and. Um, I would encourage you to keep prepping, to have questions written out based on the materials that you have. Um, but uh, I really appreciate that you came back over and that you've been following the rules. I also want to encourage you, sir, uh, to, if you choose, to wear your suit or other street clothes. It is your ch choice. I will let you make that choice. Um, um, is there anything the state wants to address right now or any record you want to make? No, Your Honor, thank you. Mr. Brooks, anything you want to address right now or any record you want to make? Uh, no, I just um, thank you for um, giving me a chance to come back in. and I, I appreciate what you said. It works well when you're here, sir. I hope, you, I hope we continue this. I to say something very, very quick. I was uh waiting for my COVID results to come back before i feel comfortable getting back dressed up so i kind of just prefer to just stay in the, the orange right now all right that's your choice they said i should be having the results hopefully by the time i get back i might know some if not i'll know some tomorrow morning so that would be a big influence on okay fair enough that's uh it for today good night everyone we'll see everyone at 8 30 tomorrow morning True and international pressure.